Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to Rethinking Systems Design for Racial Justice and Equity. My name is Sarah Del Neal-Budish, and this is my colleague and friend, Neil McGarrigan. Um, and we're both lecturers on law and clinical instructors at Harvard Law School, um, specifically at the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program, where I'm also assistant director. Um, this is the third and final event in a three-part symposium series exploring this theme this spring. Um, and we've had the honor and joy of collaborating with our amazing colleagues uh, in the series at the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State and the Gould Center for Conflict Resolution at Stanford Law School. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I want to echo uh, Sarah's warm welcome and also start with an acknowledgement that we are sitting today in a studio on the Harvard Law School campus, which is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is today known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, as well as to the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The symposium today aims, and, and in the past two sessions as well, aims to center critical questions of racial justice and equity that are both grounded in the past and also forward looking. And that call for also new perspectives and create space for broader inclusivity and push us to embrace complexity and nuance and sometimes discomfort. And so we hope that this event today and all three of the events together um, as a part of a symposium series that is devoted to rethinking how we honor and address historical and ongoing justice in its own way helps to honor the Massachusetts people and this land. But this is not by no means the only land from which we collectively come together today um, to give a sense of who's in our virtual room today. Uh, we have folks joining this event from across the country, um, from California to DC, Washington State to Illinois, Maryland, Georgia, Minnesota, North Carolina, Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Hawaii, Missouri, Nebraska, Texas, and more, as well as Brazil, Japan, Israel, and Singapore. Uh, and we want to warmly welcome everyone uh, who came. Our group also spans uh, many roles and sectors uh, in the audience today, including all levels of government, academia, legal practice, healthcare, nonprofit work, and conflict management and peace building practice. So um, wherever you're joining us from uh, and whatever has brought you to this moment, we're so glad you're here. And in just a minute, we will introduce the first panel, which will run until approximately 2.25, when we'll take a short break until 2.45 um, and welcome in the second panel. Um, before we close uh, with a brief closing at about four o'clock. Um, the speakers today have written pieces that will be published in a special double issue of Ohio State's Journal on Dispute Resolution. Um, and those abstracts are available on Ohio State's website. And we will also post to the chat um, a little bit later in the session, a link to that um, part of the Ohio State website so you can access the um, uh, abstracts yourself. And so just also want to say that we're super grateful to the students who uh, work on that journal every day and um, have done all of the hard work of um, collecting and processing and getting the um, work to, from all of the authors that are speaking today into one place and um, for us all to be able to um, appreciate for posterity and into the um, upcoming journal, journal um, uh, edition. Um, we're also grateful for many people at Harvard Law School who made this event possible today, um, including the amazing team from Learning Experience and Technology, who's running our tech, uh, the facilities and catering teams for preparing the viewing room that we have here for students to uh, come and tune in and engage with the event. Um, and then last, but uh, in always first, uh, we want to acknowledge our colleague, Tracy Blanchard, HMCP's program coordinator, um, without whom we could have not gotten to this moment today. Um, so at this time, I'd like to hand it over to Rachel Viscomi. Um, Rachel is our uh, wonderful colleague who's the clinical professor of law, a clinical professor at law at Harvard Law School and the director of the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Rachel. Thank you. It is my, it's my great pleasure to get to say hello and to, to welcome folks um, this morning to add my welcome to Sarah and Niels. Um, and that was an incredible list that, that Sarah shared of, of places from, from where folks are joining us. And that's just incredibly heartening to know that people are with us from so many different areas of the country, of the world, and, and we're really excited to be here together. Um, so as someone whose role has been entirely to cheer this event on from the sidelines, um, best role ever, I just want to echo the thanks that Neil and Sarah have offered to all of the folks whose work has gone into making today's event a reality. Um, and I want to really um, 
add to those thanks, my deep appreciation and acknowledgement for all of the incredible work that Neil and Sarah have done. Um, so the, the tireless commitment and dedication that they have shown to really trying to build an event that would honor the importance of the topic that it addresses has been inspiring. And so I have been deeply touched and very grateful to them and um, really inspired and in awe of the, the, the work and the, um, the thoughtfulness and the colleagueship and the, the deep care that they've brought to trying to, um, to build this event uh, for you and with you today. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really um, excited to be able to, to watch, to learn, um, and to benefit from their, their commitment to helping to make, make the world a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so the, the pandemic and the challenges of the last several years, I think have really drawn into starker relief um, the deep inequities that shape all facets of our society, bringing to the collective for what many among us have never been able to look away from or turn, turn gaze from. And these years have isolated us and they've also brought us together. And it is a gift in many ways that, that we are able and have been able for so many different events over the course of the last couple of years to join together and to really um, shine a collective light, turn um, collective attention um, on the challenges that face us as, as a collective. Um, so as we face into what are some of the deepest and the thorniest challenges that we face as a field, as a nation, as a globe, um, it, it heartens me to remember that as enduring and intractable as many of these issues are, they're matched only by the intensity of the passion and, and commitment um, that is being brought to face them, um, which I feel is really palpable um, in this event, in this series of events, and in so many other, um, so many of just the daily activities that are that are happening in these times, and that that I um, that I hope will continue to be a really important source of repair and healing. Um, so one of the the quotes that that I was reflecting on um, this morning that I think gets at some of the challenge and the nuance of this work um, is a quote from the, the late great Bell Hooks uh, who asked, how do we hold people accountable for wrongdoing and yet at the same time remain in touch with their humanity enough to believe in their capacity to be transformed? Um, and as we, as we hold that, it, it also thinking about that, thinking about the progress that's been made um, on those fronts and the progress that that stands before us that is yet to be made. Um, I wanted to share a blessing uh, by John O'Donohue. And it is a blessing that is called uh, for someone awakening to the trauma of his or her past. Um, so while this is a, a blessing that he addressed toward an individual, I'd like us to but I'd like to invite us to hold it and think about it as a collective invitation um, as we are a, a collective that is facing um, the trauma of our collective past. So hear it as you will. For someone awakening to the trauma of his or her past. For everything under the sun, there is a time. This is the season of your awkward harvesting when pain takes you where you would rather not go. Through the white curtain of yesterdays to a place you had forgotten you knew from the inside out. And a time when that bitter tree was planted that has grown always invisibly beside you and whose branches your awakened hands now long to disentangle from your heart. You are coming to see how you're looking often darkened when you should have felt safe enough to fall toward love how deep down your eyes were always owned by something that faced them through a dark fester of thorns, converting whoever came into a further figure of the wrong. You could only see what touched you as already torn. Now the act of seeing begins your work of mourning and your memory is ready to show you everything. Having waited all these years for you to return and know. Only you know where the casket of pain is interred, 
You will have to scrape through all the layers of covering and according to your readiness, everything will open. May you be blessed with a wise and compassionate guide who can accompany you through the fear and grief until your heart has wept its way to your true self. As your tears fall over that wounded place, may they wash away your hurt and free your heart. May your forgiveness still the hunger of the wound so that for the first time, you can walk away from that place, reunited with your banished heart, now healed and freed and feel the clear, free air, bless your new face. And with that, I will hand it back to Sarah. Thank you so much, Rachel. I am so pleased to introduce the speakers for our first panel today, which is called New Questions and New Directions for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, I'm only going to give the most minimal introductions. These are really just snippets uh, for time's sake, but I really encourage everyone to check out the full bios, which are on the conference website, um, because we have a truly incredible group here. So first we have Aaron Bloom. Aaron is a legal and policy expert specializing in peacemaking, fragile interdisciplinary states, and public safety and security. Um, Aaron uh, uh, has worked domestically implementing community-based gun violence reduction strategies and internationally providing technical advising on the Syrian peace negotiations and ceasefire talks. Um, and in all this work, she's helped develop and implement systems designed to promote stability, collaboration, and security in the face of violence and conflict. She's now a senior director at the Metropolitan Group. Her co-author is Lisa Dicker. Lisa is a clinical instructor at the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program and a lecturer in law at Harvard Law School. Lisa has deep international experience having advised delegations to the Sudanese peace talks, the UN-led intra-Syrian peace process, and the Astana ceasefire talks for Syria. She has also counseled practitioners across the Middle East and North Africa, government and civil society actors in Tanzania, and local peace building initiatives in Yemen. Next, we have Professor Sarah Cole, who is the Michael E. Moritz Chair of Alternative Dispute Resolution at The Ohio State Moritz College of Law. She is a distinguished and prolific contributor uh, at, in her scholarship teaching and practice in ADR, uh, having published numerous texts in the field, most recently discussions in dispute resolution, as well as uh, the leading treatises in mediation and dispute resolution. She served on numerous arbitration panels and served as a advisory faculty member in the drafting of the Uniform Mediation Act. Uh, Professor Cole co-authored an article for the series with Grand Lum and Nancy Rogers. Next, we have Frank Dukes. Professor Dukes is a lecturer and Distinguished Institute Fellow at the Institute for Engagement and Negotiation at the University of Virginia School of Architecture. In his teaching as well as his practice, he helps groups address complex uh, uh, public problems and conflicts through collaborative change projects around environment and land use, water, historic landscapes, community development, education, and health. In 2020, he was a member of the design team for UVA's award-winning Memorial to Enslaved Laborers. Professor Dukes co-authored a paper for this series with Dr. Selena Cozart. Professor Amy Schmitz is a professor and the John D. Verdrinko Baker and Hostetler Chair in Law at the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law. She's also affiliated with the Ohio State Program on Data Governance and the Divided Community Project. She's an expert in online dispute resolution, serving as a fellow at the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, as well as the co-chair of the ABA Technology Committee of the Dispute Resolution Section and the ODR Task Force. She also hosts the Arbitration Conversation, a podcast that recently reached over 100 episodes. Her co-author is Oladeji Tiamiu. Oladeji is a clinical fellow at the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program. Prior to joining HNMCP, Oladeji was an online dispute resolution fellow at the uh, Resolution Systems Institute in Chicago, where he helped in developing a pilot online dispute resolution program for family law disputes. Oladeji has also worked with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Constitutional Review Commission in the Gambia and he has experience as a teacher and community organizer. He's a fellow podcaster hosting Convergence, an original podcast on the intersection between technology and dispute resolution. Our moderator for this conversation today is Aminta Awesome. Aminta is a lecturer on law and clinical instructor in the International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School, where she supervises projects focused on equality, inclusion, and economic and social rights. In addition to research on socioeconomic rights, she has interest in human rights diplomacy, the role of identity in advocacy, and symbioses between civil and human rights movements. Aminta previously served as a human rights officer at the United Nations, where she supported the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture and the Special Rapporteurs of the Human Rights Council in fact-finding, advocacy, and training in Africa, Latin America, social, uh, excuse me, Southeast Asia, and Europe. We are so honored to have you all here today. This is an amazing conversation, and I'm going to hand it off to Aminta to kick it off. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. And I wanna say hello to everyone and hi from the viewing room that we have for this event at Harvard Law School. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Amenta Awesome and I'm a clinical instructor at the International Human Rights Clinic here at Harvard. As Sarah mentioned, I will serve as moderator for today's first panel, which is entitled New Directions and New Questions for Truth and Reconciliation. And this panel is really focused on drawing out lessons from truth and reconciliation efforts and other efforts that could be applied to initiatives aimed at advancing racial justice here in the United States. Um, I'm delighted to be able to facilitate a conversation between these six incredible scholars and practitioners who've played crucial roles designing, engaging, and observing a range of initiatives established to account for past injustice or to facilitate social change. Um, thanks to all the panelists for sharing your research and insights today. Um, the format that today's conversation will take is that of a moderated discussion where I will start us off with a few questions to the panelists and then we'll turn to questions from all of those who are following along with us virtually and here on campus. Um, so for those who are following both in the room and online, we're asking that you submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A function. Um, we also have no cards here in the classroom created specifically for this panel. So feel free to submit your questions and comments at any point in the discussion and we'll do our best to incorporate as many of the interventions as we can. Okay, so getting us started, I'd like to start us off with a question that allows us to kind of foreground the organizing assumptions of the conversation, um, acknowledging that the session is titled New Directions and New Questions for Truth and Reconciliation. The title itself gives us a hint as to the types of systems that could be established to advance racial justice. Um, we know that a truth and reconciliation mechanism, for example, is one model for pursuing truth and e equity. However, it's not the only model. Um, and we know that even that model is itself not a monolith. So um, I'd like to maybe start by asking Sarah Cole um, from her experience, what opportunities um, do truth seeking models offer to those pursuing racial justice? And, and how does the framing of that work actually affect its goals and outcomes? So maybe I'll let Sarah, Sarah speak a bit and then for any panelists that, that wanna react, please feel free to jump in. I mean to thank you so much. And I wanna apologize in advance if there's any extraneous noise where I am. I'm actually joining you from uh, the USTA National Tennis Campus in uh, Florida where my son is playing his final competitive tennis match. Um, so I wanna thank Harvard and Ohio State um, or it's College of Law and Stanford for being willing to host this wonderful series. And I wanna thank my colleague, Bill Froelich, who um, has done such a tremendous job coordinating all of these symposia. And, and you, you all have had a little taste of what we benefit from every day at Moritz. Um, and finally, I want to suggest to you that, you know, though I may have some expertise in dispute resolution generally, I'm definitely a learner with respect to truth and reconciliation commissions and this area of work. And I've been guided very much by Nancy Rogers um, and Bran Lum, and we're, we're still sort of continuing in our search, um, trying to provide assistance um, to truth and reconciliation commissions and other organizations seeking to advance um, racial equity. And what we're trying to do, I think at this point, is to look at the number of cities and the state, um, California, which have uh, convened initiatives to advance racial equity. And they're often named Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, although even that naming um, creates potentially some framing concerns that the commission should be aware of. But why is this happening now? I think I'm telling you something you already know when I say that we're trying to, I think these commissions are trying to capture a moment in time when there is greater public support for um, advancing racial equity. And one of, I think, the major challenges I've seen for these commissions um, is, is the issue of time. Uh, and that we're looking primarily at publicly created commissions. And oftentimes it seems as though the legislature thinks if we establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in two years, we'll have results or resolutions or reconciliations. And I think what becomes clear, and I think Frank may um, talk about this with respect to his not kill your work, is this is such an ongoing project. And um, I think he'll talk also about whether it makes sense to have states and other legislative bodies, um, state legislatures and other legislative bodies address these issues, which really are systemic and endemic and cannot be 
resolved within a you know a two year or other defined period. Um, one of the things we're looking at is is to look at what kinds of goals um, these various commissions are attempting to achieve. Um, are they trying to simply recount and commemorate the past? Um, because truth telling uh, can be a very valid and appropriate um, uh, endeavor for a truth and reconciliation commission, um, but may also have uh, impact on those who hear the truth. And for some, it may be persuasive, and for others, it may be divisive. And you know, right, right there, as you think about what the goal of your commission is, you have to think about what what you're trying to accomplish and how that's going to impact other audiences who may not embrace that as a focal point. Um, is the goal to remedy injustices? Uh, I, you know, in, in California, um, in, in terms of the idea of giving reparations, it seems as though the focus is to remedy injustices. That, that doesn't seem to be, be the goal of all commissions. And again, raises the question of, are you, um, are you creating a big tent in which all are going to be interested in participating, or are you focusing on the group um, who have suffered the injuries? Is it about achieving mutual understanding? Um, is it about bringing about major changes uh, that improve racial equity across the board, in which case you're going to need so much more buy-in with respect uh, to the focus of the commission. So what, what we're trying to look at is how framing the goals and framing the acts uh, or uh, focal points for a commission can impact um, the outcomes um, and the process itself. And we are are, are starting by looking at just what is framing. Um, framing defined is a process of creating a structure designed to facilitate discussion and resolution of an issue. Um, and we're looking at various disciplines that use framing. One, one close to my heart is mediation. Um, and those of you who are mediators know that the framing and mediation, um, though it may have something to offer truth and reconciliation commissions, is a bit sort of narrow in that mediators really try to frame towards the future. In fact, they reframe um, the words of the, those telling their stories in ways that may be problematic, um, but with the underlying goal of resolution, um, that the mediators are not thinking so much about how their reframing may impact those who are speaking um, and, and maybe um, yeah. oppress or, or um, anger those who they are reframing, um, but they're thinking about their goal of ultimate resolution of the dispute in front of them. And so in, we're gonna think a little bit about how that reframing that a mediator does can be helpful in truth and reconciliation commissions, but recognizing that it may be only a value when the focus of the truth and reconciliation commission is on moving forward and not worrying so much or acknowledging um, past racial injustices. Um, so we're gonna look at framing from a variety of different perspectives. And I think what we discovered and Nancy mentioned at the last symposia, symposium was that nobody has the answer for this. There is no off the shelf advice, um, but perhaps some wisdom that can be gleaned. Uh, and and Minta, I don't wanna go on too long, but let me briefly mention the New York City Racial Justice Commission, which is really working hard and over a great deal of time, trying to come up with a, 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 an, a framing that um, brings more folks into the tent um, and hopefully is the kind of framing that will create lasting change, at least within New York City. And some of the techniques they've used, which we're going to explore in greater depth in the paper, um, are that they were consultative. They solicited and considered the views of the public and of experts. They focused on using inclusive language. Um, they talk about the proposals in their report aimed to shift direction of government to better represent the values of New Yorkers. Um, so trying to create a big tent to bring folks in. Yet they also chose some language that might be perceived as charged. Um, they use words like structural, or phrases like structural racism, racism, words like equity, but rejected phrases like critical race theory or reparations. And so they're trying to make some intentional um, choices, which I think they hope will bring in uh, more voices and more folks who are willing to listen. Uh, but they're making some intentional choices, which will be um, and are very interesting to study. So I'll stop there for a moment and, and see if others wanted uh, to chime in on this topic. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I feel like there's so much um, food for thought there about time and 
whether some whether the mechanism is sort of forward looking, whether the goal is to look backwards, whether it's some combination of the two. Um, and you had a lot there about um, the idea of having a big tent a consultative process or something that's uh, more narrowly tailored, perhaps to people who've been victims of racial injustice. Um, and that actually brings me to my second question. So maybe I'll turn to that question before bringing in other panelists. Um, a lot of scholarship on truth and reconciliation commissions, at least in the international sphere, which I'm um, uh, more familiar with, has pointed to the democratizing potential of the initiatives um, as compared to other types of, of forums. Um, for example, truth-seeking processes are thought to enable many different voices to participate in dialogue about justice and social change. Um, on the other hand, we know from our friends who study um, critical legal studies, for example, that systems for establishing truth and justice are, you know, they're human creations. Um, so they have our humanity kind of baked into them. Um, and that may mean that mechanisms which are designed to pursue justice may have historical injustices that kind of um, color the work that, that, that they're doing. Um, and so I know that um, both Amy and Lisa, your, your pieces have touched on different aspects of this um, about different interests and um, about different um, sort of power imbalances among participants in, in these kind of um, initiatives. So I maybe we'll start with Amy and then go to Lisa. Are there concerns you have that are kind of in this regard? Um, what should what kind of considerations should be kept in mind for addressing either past exclusion or power imbalances or other considerations that might be within this sort of topic, um, Amy? Yeah, thank you. So, and I thank you to everyone again. Um, I say thank you for um, this wonderful just series um, has been amazing. I'm so happy to be part of it. Um, yeah, these are incredibly important um, and rich questions to be asking. I think. I think back to um, in 2017, I taught comparative dispute resolution at UWC in South Africa. And we looked um, at a lot of different systems and how history really baked into the process and can sometimes really create hurdles to free expression, to feeling heard, to achieving the goals that we seek to achieve through these various really restorative justice processes. Um, and so some of the concerns as I think through sort of history and fast forward and really missed opportunities is how can we, as Sarah greatly mentioned, you know, we want to have a broad tent, right? We want to lower the, burdle, the hurdles to expression and we want to have more of a democratizing effect that in fact is democratizing. And I think that's where technology can really come in and provide a very rich avenue, but only if we preserve optionality. I think optionality and um, Oladeji will probably speak to this as well. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about optionality and the importance of not cutting off avenues to expression, but instead expanding avenues to expression using technology. But with technology comes power. We talked about this at the Ohio State um, Symposium as well, is this idea of you know, technology can be helpful for expanding expression, but it can also create hurdles and problems if inappropriately used. For example, we can think about social media and how Facebook um, and negative AI and how sometimes that can promote negative discourse instead of positive discourse. So how can we use technology while preserving optionality and being intentional? And so that's where I think system design and really getting back to basics and thinking about who are the stakeholders, what the goals are, and really taking the time to reimagine access to justice, access to expression, and meeting people where they are, right? Understanding that there is a digital divide. So any kind of avenues that you might open up, you can be creative, right? We can be creative in using technology, using apps, using mobile-friendly expression that can be also very flexible. One of the other things we've learned in looking at system design over time and in looking at truth and reconciliation, and if you study different processes and you look at how they improve if they are well-intentioned and flexible and dynamic. And Sarah brought up a great point about time, right? Because over time, you learn that you might have to shift your focus. We talked a lot about this in the Ohio um, Symposium as well, is how the best truth and reconciliation projects are willing to shift 
are willing to be flexible in light of the needs of the stakeholders, the communities, and the type of expression. And I think that that is also another aspect. So being optional, providing optionality, being intentional, rethinking the way that we access expression, not just channels, but type, right? It doesn't have to just be that you're opening up online access perhaps, but also type, art, expression, different types of ways of expressing yourself and promoting healing. Um, I think there's a lot there that we have not really truly uncovered in racial justice. And I'm really hopeful that through this symposium, we can be forward thinking and be creative in the way that we consider using online processes and using technology in an ethical manner um, and thinking about different ways that we can promote positive um, discussions. Excellent, thank you so much, Amy. And Lisa, I'll just turn it to you directly. Yeah, excellent. And I think that um, uh, uh, like Amy and others, Aaron and I come from a comparative lens um, on transitional justice. As you heard in our introductions, most of our work has been internationally um, and working in, in the global context. And so there's a, a number of considerations that, that we typically keep in mind both in our research and in our practical work um, when establishing a transitional justice system. And I frame them as considerations because they're, they're questions usually, not answers um, as far as how not to replicate harm in any given context since there's no one size fits all approach. I think one of the first things that comes to mind um, to me in my work is like who has the power of designing and implementing the system? Um, is it the harmed community or is it primarily those who are trying to protect their power or have a vested interest in a specific outcome that shields them from accountability or from having to reform themselves or their actions in some way? Um, I think echoing Sarah as well, like thinking through how we're framing the system. Um, most truth-seeking mechanisms that are successful globally um, do begin with the assumption and the premise that harm has been done. So it's not harmed communities trying to persuade others through the mechanisms that they have been harmed, um, which can replicate harm. Um, and it is especially in a manner in which if those that are those also participating in the system deny that harm has occurred, um, although it is more democratized with a large um, with a large 10 approach, it can actually replicate harm as well if there's the denial of what has occurred. Um, so mechanisms often begin with the premise of there has been harmed, but then there, or there has been harm rather, but then their focus is in defining the scope and nuances of the harm, as well as next steps as a society that can try to remedy it. Um, which kind of leads to the, the next point um, as well, which is that typically truth seeking mechanisms lead into definite next steps. Um, if the purpose has been to simply establish a um, historical narrative, and I say simply, but that's typically not that simple. Um, then there needs to be buy-in to that narrative writ large. Um, uh, but oftentimes also truth-seeking mechanisms are leading into the other pillars of transitional justice. They're not done into iso in isolation, such as publishing reports um, uh, that are emphasizing guarantees of non-recurrence, such as institutional reforms, or promoting accountability, whether that's through prosecutions or other forms of accountability, or recommending um, uh, 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 reparations programs, individual, collective, memorialization, um, et cetera. And so one thing that we, we watch out for in global context on um, areas to not replicate harm is stopping short after truth seeking itself and kind of saying that it's done at that point, but rather it has unearthed the harms, the scope, the nuances of it, and typically identified what should be done next in order to move forward um, as a society. And then I think also something that we, we, we wanna keep in mind is sometimes implementation inadvertently um, replicates harms. Um, for instance, um, if certain categories of individuals are left out of the of the mechanisms um, completely unintentionally. So for instance, a lot, a, in um, a lot of global contexts, uh, uh, large truth seeking mechanisms, whether it's a truth commission or otherwise, um, are, how, are um, held in large urban areas. Um, that leaves out a, a lot of rural, remote, or indigenous communities um, that are unable to access them. Um, and so I, looping back to, to Amy's point, thinking of ways in which we can reach folks in a multi-door courthouse kind of setting, um, even in transitional justice approaches, um, so that we're able to spread the reach and not inadvertently or inadvertently um, recreate harms. Excellent. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, a lot of uh, food for thought there and a lot, I think, that ties into the past symposia in the series on the theme of intentionality and really the connection between the mission of a mechanism or a forum or initiative 
and the process and procedure of how that unfolds. Um, I think a lot is, there's a lot to be said about the need to tailor the design to the goals. Um, and I, I know that many of the panelists have a lot of insight in this area, but I'd like to start with maybe asking Frank and Oladeji from your own experiences and research um, about insights you might have into how processes and outcomes connect. Um, are there actually observations you've made about the modalities of past crew seeking efforts that, that could be applied to future racial justice initiatives? Um, maybe I'll turn to Frank first and then um, Oladeji, feel free to jump right, right in after Frank gives his, his contribution. Thanks, Amita, and thanks everybody for being here. I've really enjoyed the, uh, the first two sessions and the first two, it's so tempting just to jump into um, what, what you all have already been talking about, but I will follow the question, um, which is informed certainly by a lot of reading, but also uh, as a mediator facilitator, um, a lot of hands-on experience, which I'm gonna mostly talk about. And my experience um, in large part working in collaboration with my co-author, Selena Cozart, um, who spoke at the second session. Um, and we've done quite a bit of work together. And then also observing Greensboro and, um, and actually helping out a little bit at the end of their truth and reconciliation process. And thinking one of the things you said, Sarah, the, um, the, the, the sort of endurance or you know, a couple of years um, when we, we brought Nelson and Joyce Johnson who were the driving force behind Greensboro up to Charlottesville. And um, that was one of the things they told us that uh, the time commitment um, has to go beyond a year, two years, three years, four years. Their commission ended in 2004. They're still implementing the recommendations that they had from it. And it took them probably 15 years to actually create that commission as well. So one of the lessons from that is not, not patience per se, but an enduring commitment. Uh, you know, that, that, that um, the idea that the changes aren't gonna happen all at once, um, but that if we keep that commitment that the change is in fact possible. Um, I think our focus, uh, well, I'm going to actually first show a slide, just uh, drawing on some of the experience from Charlottesville. So these are not necessarily coordinated. Um, there's no great overall plan that's been driving these different um, efforts, but they often are, are overlapping. And we do have, if you look at the lower left corner, at least on my screen, that there is a Truth Commission effort. And that's been three and a half years of planning to create a truth Commission. We don't actually call it reconciliation. Part of the reason for that is um, the question that we ask ourselves, how can you reconcile a relationship that was never the type of relationship that you wanted to exist before? So we're talking about systemic transformation and, and reparations. Um, we look at institutions, the uh, Jefferson School, the institutionalizing of an African-American Heritage Center being key to all of that. University of Virginia creating an equity center um, to, to see whether or not we can actually not be uh, extracting always from the community, but actually in authentic partnership with the community. We've had a number of descendants uh, groups now that have been uh, forming, University of Virginia descendants group, Monticello, Highland, Montpelier, all presidential homes. Um, speaker series that, um, that you know, a lot of people have had also. Uh, and I think the landscape too, we had the Blue Ribbon Commission that I served on that was charged with um, changing the way that we talk about race and creating a deeper understanding of that. And then um, pilgrimage um, uh, that we've taken 2018 in Montgomery for the lynching uh, effort. We're doing another one um, this year as well. So I'm drawing from the personal experiences both as a community member active in these, but also as a third party facilitator and mediator. And um, one of the things that this project has allowed us to do, Selena and I to be able to do is actually, we've had many, many conversations about what are the lessons that we're having from here. And, and some of those, even though we, we come from different backgrounds, we actually do bring similar ways of thinking um, and being and acting to this work. So I think a key element of learning is this commitment to learning about the ongoing harms of white supremacy culture and anti-blackness and understanding the historical frame of these harms and not being afraid to name that. Um, allowing for that to actually become normalized the, as part of the conversation. And that it, it, the white supremacy culture provides a really powerful lens for understanding a broad array of historical harms, uh, even as we need to drill down further to specific elements, you know, colonialism, anti-blackness, misogyny, anti-Semitism, anti-immigrant. Um, I think also a willingness to see people in community both as individuals 
who deserve care and kindness and a willingness to listen and understand their views, but also as they're located within systems and structures that mean a need for differential treatment on the basis of their situation. I really love John Powell's framing of this at the last session, targeted universalism, and uh, really I've been playing around in conversations with people about, about that. I think the idea that positive change is possible given the right set of tools and what we've come up with over the last 15 years since we first began working on um, uh, uh, in Charlottesville with the university and, and created what became the University and Community Action for Racial Equity. What we are both naming, we're naming equity as both a, a goal of the outcome, but also an element of the process. So to have an equitable collaborative process, we need, first of all, to be trauma informed, to be able to address the harms that have done and, and to be able to have effective conversations, understanding that the, the trauma impacts the way people can participate. Um, that it needs to be um, truth seeking. Um, and that can be many different dimensions of that. It needs to be um, inclusive and inclusive doesn't just mean everybody's welcome. It means looking at the identities that are present there and saying, I see those identities. I wanna understand more about those identities. And, and what is it about your identities that would have you participate in this and how can we make it, make it welcome for you? Um, responsive to people that are participating. And then the idea, and as a mediator and facilitator, deliberative. The deliberative process means that we are coming in understanding that we, yes, we will maintain our core values, um, but we have something to learn and I can learn from you and I can learn from the others and something different to understand as part of that. And then not in, in echoing, sorry, not, um, there's no one process that can be replicated everywhere, right? We need to be adapting to our own circumstances and adapting as, um, as change is taking place. So um, I think also a recognition that some people mistake their need for belonging as a desire for exclusive ownership and control and that our work fundamentally is about moving to belonging and shared ownership and control from that. And um, I'm kind of a sadness, uh, you know, Sarah, you mentioned Montpelier and I wasn't sure I was gonna mention it. Our paper initially was gonna be talking about our success at Montpelier, facilitating an agreement, a groundbreaking agreement that was sharing power between the Montpelier Descendants Committee, the 300 enslaved people there and, and the, uh, the board, um, which has mostly paid attention to um, James Madison there, although, although certainly paid attention to the enslaved also. So I'm, I'm not gonna get into that more. Most of what we did was confidential, but just sharing yesterday's Washington Post editorial for people that may not have seen that and how um, uh, unfortunately the, the, the often the sharing of power is seen as a loss instead of a gain. Um, and then just a couple more recognizing that, that um, that conflict, while often painful and destructive, is necessary. And I love Frederick Douglass in many, many ways, but one of his quotes that I'm sure most people have heard, those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are those who want crops without plowing up the ground, rain without thunder and lightning, ocean without the awful roar. Um, there's a new book uh, out uh, called The Neutrality Trap. Um, and it actually says we need to embrace chaotic disruption as a way of disrupting the system and strategic disruption, that we need, we need both of those elements for that. And, and for Selena and I, this third party role that we play is not neutrality, um, it's independence uh, and impartiality. Um, neutrality can let power and privilege rule the show and, and that's not what we're about. So um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to hearing what everybody else has to say too. Thank you, Frank. And I think one of the first points that you made was that I, um, we, we, I would love to actually hear from, from other panelists the response to some of the other, the other conversations, and I'm sure that sparks some ideas. But before going to that, I would, I would want to pass it to Oladiji because I know that um, you and Amy have been working on a piece that's looking at um, what opportunities technology can bring in these, in these processes and in um, de designing the system um, for pursuing racial justice or accounting for, for, for past harms. So I'd love to hear a little bit about um, some of the some of the main sort of takeaways you have in that piece, um, and also to hear um, some of the thoughts you have about connecting and um, being intentional, connecting the goals of, of, of a system to, to the process. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, um, first off, thank you, Aminta, for moderating this, and I'll just continue on that thread around process and outcomes. 
And I like that framing because from my perspective, and I'm sure for most of us on this webinar today, uh, can agree that the design of a truth commission necessarily informs what outcomes are possible. And because truth commissions are seeking to address or raise issues related to systemic problems within society, the role of the system designers in structuring the process takes on a whole new air of significance. So also putting on my, my comparative lens to follow up with uh, the comparative lens that Lisa brought to the discussion, there, there are a few examples where the procedures of a truth commission and the system design of the truth commission insufficiently fostered civil society engagement. And that will always lead to unfulfilled aspirations when civil society is not properly engaged. And the, the easiest example from a comparative lens is with the DRC's Truth Commission, the Democratic Republic of Congo's Truth Commission, where reconciliation procedures didn't really engage as much as it needed to with um, different groups in society that were involved in the conflict. And this raises one of the key questions for any truth commission, uh, and that is what procedures can we implement so that stakeholders from different backgrounds engage with one another in a genuine, honest way about the factors that contributed to civil unrest. So the argument that Amy, Colin, and I uh, are making in this paper is in direct response to this key question around engaging with civil society in a fruitful way so that the outcomes are more impactful. Um, and our argument is that technology has to play an important complement to any in-person reconciliation initiative. The goal here is, as Amy touched on earlier, is so that stakeholders have optionality in engaging with the commission's proceedings. A multi-door um, approach for people accessing truth commission proceedings. And secondly, using technology to complement in-person processes, the aspiration is to expand the group of stakeholders that can actually participate, recognizing that so many groups in our, uh, it, it, certainly within America, are accustomed to engaging both on challenging subject, subjects and intimate subjects, in digital online spaces, right? So thinking concretely about how we can bring that expectation that many in our, in our communities have for digital spaces, bringing that into a truth commission um, so that it can complement in-person proceedings. And we, we are beginning to see, I would say the starts of truth commissions thinking really creatively and concretely about how to incorporate technology in the system design. Going back to the comparative lens, we've seen in the Gambia, for instance, which uh, recently finished its truth commission's proceedings in 2021, uh, every hearing that was conducted by the truth commission was live streamed. And the explicit aspiration was for a wider group of people to have a shared understanding of the historical events that uh, contributed to the country's crisis. And these live streamed hearings serve to complement in-person proceedings. Uh, in, in the Gambia, they actually called it village dialogues, where community elders would facilitate in-person conversations to reflect on information that was shared in the live streamed hearings. So we're still in the early innings, I would say, of how truth commissions are exploring the use of technology to complement in-person proceedings. The argument we're, we're making is just that um, when we think creatively and constructively around how uh, technology can complement this, more groups will be able to participate and they'll also be able to do so in a much more comfortable way than having to go to a physical location as the only option for engaging with truth commissions. Um, so that's, that's in a sum, that's the main argument our paper is trying to make and uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you, Aminta. Great, thank you for sharing so much rich um, experience from the comparative lens and sort of bringing in our understanding of how 
how technology can can complement and and not sort of replace the in person engagement um, that's so necessary for for um, these these dialogues. Um, I just wanted to give a quick reminder to those of you watching and listening that um, we are actually accepting some some questions via the Zoom Q and A function. So so please feel free at any point. Um, I'm hoping to turn to those those questions soon. Um, but first, I want to actually give the panelists a chance if you if you wanted to address any of the questions that came up before, because I know there's a lot of rich experience here um, from, from Frank, your experience at Charlottesville, um, Sarah talking about the, the work that's going on in New York, um, and then uh, Lisa and Aaron, um, very um, rich comparative perspectives from the international, from the inter international field. Um, I, I, I'm just going to give Aaron a quick um, chance in case she wants to jump in because I know that I'm, I'm speaking of inclusivity, I'm recognizing that her her voice hasn't been able to come in yet. Um, and then maybe we can go to Sarah. I saw I saw that you're you're also um, have something to say on an earlier point. Um, Aaron, um, feel free to to add any any reflections that have come to your mind so far. Yeah, absolutely, and and thank you all so much, and Amita for for. Um, facilitating this. Um, so I uh, have very much uh, an agreement with everything that's being said already. Um, I, I want to add a little bit in terms of um, kind of making sure that whatever initiative is, is being put together is responsive to and, and informed by the context that is being addressed. And so coming from a comparative perspective, um, it's so important to make sure that we're not just you know, copying and pasting and and dropping in, um, you know, a structure that will not fit and will not be effective for the context that uh, we're addressing. Um, when discussing, for example, you know, the Black American experience and in ways that make it distinct from other truth and reconciliation efforts and and TJ efforts, you know, it's. Um, it, it is generational. It includes harms that are 400 years old and, and happening today. Um, and so in terms of the scope, it is a, an incredibly challenging and complex issue to make sure that whatever uh, truth seeking effort is in place is both um, contextualizing those, those past harms and understanding how they are still having impact today and still causing harm today, as well as new harms that have been you know, conducted at every day since. Um, additionally, there's uh, the context of the fact that in America is one of the largest and most diverse countries and what is different, what happens in one state does, is not gonna be the context of the story in another state. And so even a top-down national approach will need to be um, very much localized and, and um, customized to the, the locality or the state or the region that um, that it's focused on. Um, and I, I would pull an example um, here from uh, Australia, where in the early 90s, they um, implemented a reconciliation policy that uh, is in some ways informative to what we might try to do in the United States, which is that it, it was addressing generations of harms done to um, the indigenous population and, and the aboriginal population. But there's lessons to be learned from, you know, every context and in this case, uh, lessons of what not to do. For example, uh, this policy was in almost entirely forward looking. It did not include um, an opportunity to, to address and, and remediate harms that had been done. It was about moving forward without having actually, you know, done the work, doing the work of, of actually transitioning to a, a more equitable um, society or, or conducting reforms. It also uh, was almost entirely passive in terms of government accountability and responsibility and participation. The government approved it and, and uh, you know, voiced its support, but there was no acknowledgement from uh, the Australian government about its own active participation in, in the oppression and the harms done. Um, and it was also a very individualized and private focus. And so this is getting back to Lisa's point also about making sure that this is that whatever system is or whatever you know effort is put into place is not um, putting the onus on those who are are harmed and those who are um, still suffering and and are likely you know ha experiencing fewer resources and fewer access less access to power, um, making them responsible for pursuing and, and uh, gaining their own justice. Um, and so an individualized and private focus 
removes that system, systemic accountability and systemic responsibility. Um, so yeah, thank you for giving me uh, an opportunity to just kind of like address those pieces um, and I'll, I'll throw it to the group. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, a lot of connecting a lot of themes actually that came up earlier in different conversations um, from the different panelists. So thank you for, for, for providing a, 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 an example that kind of brings to the fore the issue of time, the issue of um, you know, participation, who and how, um, and about um, how, to, how to design according to, to the goals. Um, Sarah, I wanted to pass it to you. I, I think that um, we, could, we could learn from your contribution. Thank you so much. I, I'm actually intrigued so much by what I've heard, and I, I almost wanted to ask questions myself, and I'll, I'll put it in a certain way, because I was particularly intrigued by what Lisa said about the truth-telling being essential to the success of a commission. And I, I guess I have sort of two questions on that. Um, what is success in terms of the commission? Um, you know, is it the integration of the, the plan that's created by the commission? Um, and to what extent do we have to take into account that truth telling, while perhaps essential and very important, also is a narrower frame, um, which won't engage as many people as possible or help the public necessarily understand how a commission's work relates to their core concerns, whatever those might be, whether safety, opportunity, fairness, uh, freedom, and satisfaction of, of basic needs. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really struggling with this because I'm, I'm hearing that the very important need of truth telling, but also recognizing that truth telling may only impact a small number of people who are able to come to the commission and, and that kind of gets to Amy's point about technology. How do you embrace all the people who've suffered the harms recognizing, of course, you can't really do that, but more of the people while also potentially making these um, decisions of a commission embraced more widely, or maybe we have to abandon that as a goal. Um, so I'm kind of commenting slash questioning here. Yes, I don't know, Lisa, if you have any thoughts to just quickly respond. Sure, <laughs> I'll, I'll start with, it is tough and I don't think that any, any, any country has totally figured this out yet. I think that the, the one thing that um, a, a lot of global contacts have done is make commitments to the report that is issued by the Truth Commission prior to that report being issued and saying we will implement and adopt this regardless of what it says. Um, and so that way there doesn't have to be the, like the, the, the post hoc advocacy for it. Um, and so even if some, um, uh, and there is, there is buy-in from the, like the institutions and generally, like sometimes generally the public, but through elected officials um, to the plan prior to. So even if some of the recommendations are things that strip power from certain institutions or reforms that people put, push back from, there was buy-in to the process, not and which, which then assists in the outcomes moving forward as opposed to a report being issued, recommendations being made and then trying to get buy-in to them afterwards. Um, uh, and so kind of moving that buy-in. Um, that said, um, there are few Truth Commission reports anywhere in the world that have been implemented in their full degree. Oftentimes things do get dropped from them um, uh, because of then the politicization of the report itself. Although there, there seems to be, if there was more buy-in on the front end, at least somewhat more implementation um, on, on the back end. Um, and then I think too, there, there seems to be a global challenge around defining who is coming to the Truth Commission for what for what reason? Like, are you defining the, the role of folks from a harmed community and defining the scope of the harmed community that's coming to give testimony um, to a Truth Commission or participate in dialogue as a different role than when perpetrators come or when those who are involved in institutions come or, or who are um, uh, like essentially in a, by, like a quote unquote bystander role but are not part of an institution that's being implicated um, aren't being implicated individually and aren't part of the harm community coming. And is that testimony being used in a different, um, in a different, in a different manner? Um, so yes, I, I don't think that there's a, a, a full um, a response on that, but that they're trying to grapple with how do we include a lot of voices, but then also ensure that the outcomes are not, are, are there's buy-in to them, even if it's something that those in power um, or those who are holding power in certain ways don't like. <laughs> Very interesting. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And that actually brings me to a couple of questions that I see in the Q&A um, of the chat um, from Zoom from some of our um, online attendees, which um, they're actually questions that maybe speak to this um, larger theme of wanting to balance 
um, inclusivity, broadness um, with the desire to respond to particular harms um, and, and have a process that keeps moving. Um, and so the questions are, are broadly about technology, but I wanted to bring a couple of them out and maybe Amy and Oladeji, you could jump in here. Um, one question is about how do you actually use technology to complement um, truth commissions? Um, is it a hybrid model? Um, especially in communities where you might have people who don't have stable internet access or have different levels of access to technology. How do you tackle that issue? Um, how do you make sure that participants who are who are maybe not pr um, present in person have an equal level of participation as others? Um, and then another question that came from another attendee was about just explaining more about this concept of optionality um, and its potential contribution. So maybe I'll hand it to you both um, and then we'll circle back to other panelists to, to complement some of the discussion we've had before. Great. So if that's okay, I'll start and then Oladeji, you can um, jump in or either way. So just um, beginning with sort of the idea of optionality, you know, in the world of online dispute resolution, there's been a lot of debates because in some programs, it's actually an you're required to try the, and that almost becomes a sole channel. And, and we are not advocating for that. Um, instead, optionality meaning the multi-door courthouse, the idea that you allow for many different ways to express yourself and to provide your input and to provide expression. And some of this comes from very deep research that has been done in the areas of family and consumer law as well, because it's as we have learned during the pandemic, that in a lot of ways, um, being able to communicate through online channels, it's cheaper, it's easier, it's more flexible, and it can be more comfortable. The other piece that I think is overlooked sometimes is the idea that psychologically, one can feel safer behind their own cell phone, for example. Um, and not having to be in the same room. There's deep research in the area of family law, for example, where family online dispute resolution and using technology can help individuals feel safer in being able to express themselves in these different environments. And that can be very nurturing to an individual to be able to get their expression out there in a safe environment. Um, but it also, of course, comes with challenges. Um, I love the question noting about the hybrid model and absolutely there's a concern that those in the room are gonna have more power than those who are perhaps participating through other online mechanisms. Um, and I think there are ways to sort of deal with those issues. And we in the online dispute resolution context, for example, there are different ways that you can try to manage those power imbalances because absolutely it's so important to address power imbalance. And in the paper, we do go into some concrete ideas about using ethical means and thinking about different ethical standards that have already been proposed actually in the use of technology for conflict prevention and resolution and restorative justice. And this also, a lot of the same ideas and lessons can flow into truth and reconciliation. And I think at the end of the day, when we think about optionality, and we think about sort of system design, goals, stakeholders. You know, in the world of dispute resolution, we talk a lot about fitting the forum to the fuss. I invite you to fit the tech to the fuss. And I think in this way, um, we can be very intentional in sort of preserving both the in-person and the online aspects. But I think it's a challenge and definitely we have to be creative. We have to work together um, in order to make sure that we promote this in a way that does address those power imbalances, because those are very real concerns. I love that question. Um, and perhaps um, Oladeji wants, and I just wanna add one more piece to that human-centric design. So whenever you do use technology, it is absolutely essential to remember these are humans. And maybe Oladeji wants to speak more to that issue. Um, we've had so many good discussions in writing our paper, so I don't wanna usurp all the time. Oladeji, please. I'm always enthralled by <clears throat> your ideas, Amy. So. Um, so I think there's a close connection between uh, this question and Sarah's question around how do we define success? Because the role that technology could have and should have really depends on what the objectives of a truth commission is. And I, we could frame it, maybe just from my perspective, we could frame it from three routes of um, success. One is healing, right? Another is recognition, which sometimes overlaps with healing, but not all the time, right? So having others 
recognize and understand what you've been through versus from within your community or within yourself coming to terms and um and and moving on after the healing has been done through storytelling and the third is policy changes right these are three different camps of what success could be within a truth commission so the role that technology can and should have really depends on how we're defining success if it is healing and recognition i think having groups uh being able to engage with a truth commission and, and tell their own stories on their own terms from wherever they would like to be versus having to go into a formal government or civil society connected building to talk about their stories right um these, these those are two big branches and so there are groups of people who would prefer i'm enjoying being on zoom right now from the comfort of my home it looks like i'm in a forest but this is my home. And there's a lot of comfort that comes from that. Others could feel that same way. And I think there are a lot of surveys that are exploring um, right now, all that's transpired during the pandemic, and especially in terms of how people engage with the court systems uh, and government institutions remotely during the pandemic. And some of these results are showing that people are comfortable, right? We've, we've gotten adjusted to being in our homes or being in a co-working shared space, um, we work style model. And the role that technology can have if you're seeking out healing is simply that folks, you bring the technology to the people based on their limitations, obviously, so that they can tell their stories instead of having to go to a formal location to tell their stories. Um, if it's recognition of your situation, Right now, there is this broader conversation that we're having in internationally and nationally about what the role of social media should be. How do we design social media so that people can have fruitful and difficult conversations? It's not easy. It's not easy. Um, and when you have something that is not under a model where shareholders have primacy and the objective of this online forum or social media platform is to bring people together. I think that changes what is possible within social media. And all we've seen so far is a privatized version of social media where everything is focused on uh, the value you can generate for shareholders. Things change drastically once you say, our sole and primary objective here is to bring people from different backgrounds to converse with one another, still to complement in-person proceedings, but also so that they have these digital spaces to interact with one another. I just wanna add one little piece really quickly also that um, the democratizing effect of mobile devices. Um, let's remember that, you know, we can talk about the digital divide, but mobile devices have really changed that paradigm. So I think it's important to sort of remember mobile friendly can make a big difference. Great, thank you so much, um, Ola Deji and Amy. Frank, uh, am I correct in thinking that you're, you're wanting to come in here? Yeah, I would, I would like to thank you. Um, and I don't want to be taken as disagreeing with anything anybody has said. Uh, you know, the, the element, the, the, the technology, the, the democratic potential, you know, is enormous or, or that there's not a need for federal involvement in reparations. But I do want to make the point for the local. And if, if you flip that last question around, um, thinking of our designing the memorial to enslaved laborers at UVA, it was a community driven process and we recruited about 15 community ambassadors. People are just members of the community who had relationships to go into the organizations that they belong to and have conversations with people. So a different way of making people comfortable, you know, than actually using the technology um, that had that. We're currently doing this for a project we have, which is the um, uh, uh, swords into plowshares, taking the Lee statue that stood in our central park, melting it down and then creating new art. Um, we pay community members an honorarium and we have like so far, we've just been doing it like six weeks and we have 62 groups that have been contacted and people going to speak to them. So there's other ways of doing that. And then the other element of the argument for the local is um, e even though you know, many of the systemic harms are of course at, at a national level, federal level, um, the impact is often 
very much at a neighborhood level, right? So the, the homes that couldn't get loans, you know, they didn't get water supply, you know, first to them or septic systems first to them, or they've got lead in the soil. And all, so many of those are localized. The, um, the uh, you know, which streets have sidewalks and which streets don't, which streets are safer to walk to school and which ones aren't. All of those have history. And, and our argument that we're doing here with our planning for the Truth Commission is that we need, we need it to be dis widely dispersed, that every entity, um, the different congregations, the different schools and different neighborhoods needs to be part of this process. If, um, if I have my way, we'll have a, a, a thousand people that will be commissioners. That is, they will agree that they will participate in this process and they will um, be, be watching and participating. And we will be using technology for sure, right? Recording some elements of that, but also very much localized around what has been the harm here? What is the cause of those harm? Uh, the framing we use is what are the truths here? What is, how do we understand the impact of those truths? What does repair look like? And then what kind of relationship can we have once we've been looking at all of those? So again, not an argument against a larger systemic approach, but an argument for a, a localized approach too. That's great, Frank, and actually makes me think of some work that I've done with communities um, using the international human rights framework just because the, the national legal framework actually doesn't address some of those some of those issues thinking about communities who don't have access to water, for example, um, and struggle to use, you know, constitutional rights language to to argue for that. And some of that has a historical historical background as well. But thank you for bringing it to that granular level to talk about what harms are there and how they actually perpetuate to this day. Um, I see that we have about um, 20 minutes left in our in our um, conversation, and we have some great questions from from the Q and A session. One about sort of how to to keep a transformative um, goal um, through these processes. How do we embed in positive um, rehabilitative and liberatory components into these processes? Um, another question about technology and uh, potential harm of having you know, the dialogues, which are very painful, actually coming into people's safe spaces. Um, I'm actually worried that we may not have enough time for us to address all of these, but I want to actually bring them to the panelists to sort of keep in mind as I ask you what I'm thinking is probably gonna be the final question. And maybe you wanna bring in some answers to those, to those questions when you respond. Um, I wanted to talk about sort of the fact that this title of this panel and the title of the series are actually forward looking. Um, there may be some opportunities that you've seen in your work or in your research that you feel like are missed opportunities um, that future truth and or reconciliation initiatives could take advantage of. Um, and also just with the idea of future as inspiration, um, what is the future that you would wanna see of this work? Um, and I would like to go to each of the panelists. This is why I wanna make sure we have enough time to go through this. Um, there may be some points to bring in there from, from the question and answer as well. Um, but I want to start with Sarah, um, and we'll just go into the, the order that we did of introducing each panelist. Um, Sarah, I'll have you go first. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm intrigued by so much of this. And, and I, I, I wanted to just comment first on what Frank and Amy said, because I'm not sure local excludes technology at all. Um, and I'm becoming more and more um, enamored with the concept of focusing on local, more local issues where when I see that most of the state or um, you know, even large city uh, reconciliation efforts just seem to have these time limits on them that make them unlikely to be fruitful in terms of implementing, um, as Lisa was commenting, whatever the plan is that the uh, commission or institution um, adopts. So I'm sort of, th and I'm thinking the technology would still embrace so many more people in the process who maybe don't really want to leave their houses and like to have, uh, you know, a background like Oladeji's instead of wherever uh, they're living. So anyway, um, but one thing I was thinking about with respect to that is um, just to what extent um, can we develop task forces or is it even worthwhile to have a task force that would create, um, uh, would embrace more people. Um, and, and I know I, I haven't heard a lot of um, support for the notion of, of having these types of commissions without the opportunity for truth telling. And I'm not suggesting that, but instead of framing the goals as uh, an opportunity to tell one story, even though that might be part of it, uh, that the initiative might be framed as broader than simply racial equity, not that racial equity is at all simple, but that 
um, it, it's a focus on embracing strong edu educational and healthcare opportunities for all, which would also in and of itself embrace some of the racial equity concerns. Um, you know, in, in uh, some of the work that we've looked at, uh, at least one uh, specialist and economist said that uh, his analysis was that racial inequity is a drain on community prosperity. Um, and if it's framed that way, maybe everybody's on board with, we can improve, I mean, I know I'm being a Pollyanna, but everyone can embrace this notion um, because it would help them as well as help people who have suffered from the inequities of uh, discrimination. So just, just a thought on that, that maybe thinking about framing it on a different topic um, as opposed to just a truth telling commission may be uh, useful. Great, thank you, Paul. It's really great to have this opportunity to sort of dream what, what the future might be. Um, Oladeji and Frank, I'll go to you guys next. So what, what would you like to see the future of, of um, initiatives for pursuing racial justice? Oladeji. Uh, thank you. Uh, and really interesting, Sarah, that, yeah, that captured my imagination as well. I would say the future of this work, um, we can, we can envision the future based on what we're currently seeing, in my opinion, and what we've recently seen. So the two easiest examples I'll bring up again is, is the Gambia and Tunisia. Both of those countries recent, I believe they're the two most recent countries to have a national truth and reconciliation commission. And it's quite interesting that both of them leveraged online forums for how individuals could engage with um, the, the reconciliation process. So um, in Tunisia and, and the Gambia with their Truth Commission, they had civil society organizations and individuals have the option to post videos onto um, social media, on, on the Truth Commission's social media webpage. Um, and that allowed others to comment and understand what that civil society organization's perspective was in relationship to the reconciliation initiative. And that is th that, that's still relatively recent. I think the future of this work will have creative ways for people to express themselves, whether it's digitally or in real life, in, in physical spaces, it's gonna have more uh, tools for how people can share their narratives. I think historically it's really been writing. Um, when it comes to graffiti, it's frowned upon in many jurisdictions, even though it is important for self-expression. And, and so to me, I see the future being one of much wider self-expression and a clearer and more deliberate or int <coughs> intentional conversation about what are the ethics of how we structure these systems so that individuals aren't threatened, but feel comfortable in sharing their lived experiences with others. Great, thank you very much. Um, Frank, I'll go to you. Yeah, that was, that was great. Um, such a big question. I think I'm gonna limit mine to, for people that are working in conflict, resolution, conflict transformation field. And that I would love to see um, people really consider what neutrality actually means um, and, and how um, harmful that concept actually can be to many communities who, uh, the title of our paper is, I don't want any of that neutrality, is one of the, one of the participants, you know, absolutely doesn't want us to do that. They want us to know that they, they, they want to know that we care for what they're doing um, as opposed to this sort of blank. And when we go into, when I'm working on environmental mediation, we don't go in saying, it's okay if you know, this, this contamination stays there. Um, no, we don't, we don't decide what's gonna happen, but the same thing with the sort of elements of the lingering harm that we've had in our country. And I'm using white supremacy culture as a umbrella term you know, for, for all of those uh, elements. I know there are other elements too but that we need to be understanding that and recognizing that the past is not over. And, and wherever we're working, you know, internationally, wherever we're working, that there's a past and that, and that people don't forget and that we need to address it and we need to figure out a way that we can do what we do to be independent and impartial and to be walking with people 
uh, you know, together in this path without the sort of blanket of neutrality that unfortunately allows us to avoid um, avoid doing some things that, that we really need to do. So. Thank you very much. Very, very wise um, comments there. Um, Lisa and Amy, I think I'll go to you next. Are there missed opportunities that you've seen um, from your past work that you would like to see in the future? Lisa, I'll go to you first and then we can, we can circle back to Amy. Sure, I, I don't know that it's a missed opportunity, but I think it's one that, that the transitional justice field is, is currently grappling with. The transitional justice was originally, like what it was conceived as a field about 40 years ago, um, it was really focused on justice post-transition. So there was a transition from like armed conflict to a time of relative peace, or there was a transition in government, a regime change, et cetera, moved to democracy, et cetera. And transitional justice was intended to be how to address widespread systemic harms and oppressions um, in that moment of transition. And yet I think we're seeing now this, this movement in the field to transitional justice without a transition. Um, harms are ongoing. There hasn't been large systemic change, but trying to use the mechanisms of transitional justice in order to be the transition from harm to not harm itself, um, as opposed to viewing it as an after effect. And I think you see that in like Canada, Australia, the US right now, trying to, to repurpose these mechanisms. Um, and I think it, it's an open question on how, how effectively these will, these will be, be adapted and what changes they will look like, even though we're looking at models and we're talking about today, places like Tunisia, the Gambia, South Africa, et cetera, those are in a different type of transition. Um, uh, and trying to think through like, what's different about these circumstances? What's similar? What are we actually trying to transition to um, in this moment? Um, and also what are blind spots uh, around it um, that we're having? Um, and I think we haven't, we, we, we are actively trying to figure those, those things out. Um, and I look forward to this type of conference 40 years from now, when we hopefully are able to look back on the successes from it. But this, this is a, a growth edge in a new area, just that we're simply even having a discussion like this and framing it as true seeking or transitional justice. Great, thanks so much, Lisa. I think another thing that I'm taking away is that just you know, this type of work requires some persistence and perseverance. It certainly isn't easy. Um, and I think Frank's comments really speak to that um, and experiences and as do many of your, your experiences as well. So thank you for, for bringing that into perspective. Amy. Yeah, I just want to build directly on blind spots because um, I know I wasn't even sure which thing I wanted to say because I have a lot of different thoughts. It's been so, such a fun conversation, but blind spots makes me really sort of brings home something I feel strongly about, which is breaking down silos, right? Um, Reimagining the way that we design these processes, making sure that everyone, getting more people involved, more stakeholders involved in the actual design of the process with ethics at the core, because I feel all too often, if you look historically, um, many processes were created by lawyers, by people with the same background. They think about justice in a certain way. They think about processes in a certain way. But I think we have to be more creative, break down silos, allow for poetry, for music, for dance, for other types of expression that can be um, helped toward healing. Thank you so much, Amy. And I mean, I think a lot of your conversations are actually bringing in visual um, images in my mind. So that's really great um, on the on the idea of rethinking and reimagining, images are really actually coming to mind. Um, I'm thinking of the graffiti, the dance. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, Aaron, um, I'll give you our last word, not to not to put pressure on you, but um, oh boy. Yeah. Even one morsel of a thing that you're thinking of could be could be the future of this work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think uh, I mean everything that everyone has said has been spot on. Um, uh, in terms of kind of coming from a TJ transitional justice lens um, and and seeing truth and reconciliation efforts largely being implemented kind of post conflict or, or transition or political transition, there is this sense that um, there's like a closing window that you need to jump into before your opportunity ends to you know uh, put on a, a commission like this and address these harms. And so uh, a movement away from the idea that there is any kind of statute of limitations, um, especially when it comes to these systemic uh, systems of oppression that are continuing to, you know, iterate harms and, and cause damage, um, that, you know, there's no reason that you can't also address uh, what was done generations or decades ago. Um, and so, yeah, I think just kind of broadening that scope. 
Great, thanks so much. And as someone who, who's been in the transitional justice field and international work, I think I've learned a lot from understanding that it doesn't have to be actually after a transition, that it could be about the harms that are ongoing now. So thank you so much to all the panelists for this very fruitful conversation. Um, I wish we had another hour, another day <laughs> to keep talking and, and learning from each other, but um, we're, we're coming to our conclusion point. Um, so I'd like to thank you all, um, Aaron Bloom, Sarah Cole, Lisa Dicker, Frank Dukes, Amy Schmitz, and Oladeji Tumayu. Thank you so much for, for all of your contributions and sharing your work and wisdom um, in this panel today. Um, before passing the mic back to Sarah, I'd like to also thank the Harvard Negotiation and Mediation Clinical Program for, for inviting me to this event um, and to the organizers of the events at Stanford and at OSU, um, from which I've learned so much myself. Um, so thanks everyone. And I'll, I'll hand the mic to Sarah in our studio here. Um, take care. Thank you so much, Aminta, uh, for facilitating. And thank you to our, our panelists. I'll echo that. Um, there's so much that you shared and so much more that you could share that we didn't get to. So I, I'm intrigued by that. And I'm appreciative to all of you for um, also leaving us in a place where we're thinking ahead and thinking um, about uh, the future. And it's a reminder of how much of design is also about creativity and imagination. <laughs> um, you use the word uh, dream, Aminta, and I, I, I think it's a lovely uh, note to close this panel on. So, so thank you for leaving us in that place. Um, and thank you to everyone for tuning in. Don't go away. Um, we are coming back at 2.45 um, after a quick break um, for our second panel, um, which is uh, uh, focusing on the legal system. So um, it'll be a great conversation. You can stay on the webinar. Um, no need to close the link, although you can rejoin if you wish. And we'll see you back here at 2.45. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to the second part of today's uh, symposium session. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that my mic is on. I think that it is good. Um, for those who missed the uh, introductions at the very beginning, I'll just say again briefly my name is Neil McGarrigan. I'm a lecturer on law and a clinical instructor at Harvard Law School and have been um, thrilled to have been able to help in the preparation and planning for this three-part symposium in collaboration with our colleagues at OSU and Stanford Law School. And just delighted this afternoon to be able to um, introduce the panel and moderator for the um, second part of today's um, symposium event. And the panel this afternoon is Redesigning for Racial Justice in the Legal System. Um, and I'll do at this point no more than just introduce uh, the folks that will bring you that panel and um, then hand it over to them um, to uh, hear what they are, uh, bring for us to us for the rest of the afternoon. And then we'll join back together at the end at about four o'clock to close things out. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to begin by introducing um, the panelist. Um, uh, first, Richard Fraze. Richard Fraze is a professor emeritus at University of Minnesota Law School. Um, and he is the Benjamin N. Berger Professor of Criminal Law Emeritus and former co-director of the Rabina Institute of Criminal Law and Criminal Justice. He's also the founder and former co-director of the Rabina Institute's Sentencing Guideline Resource Center and the Institute's Criminal History Enhancements Project. He has taught criminal law and the Federal Defense Clinic and a number of other um, criminal justice clinics. He's a prolific writer whose many published works uh, examine state sentencing guidelines, punishment and proportionality theories, um, and then criminal procedure in the US and abroad, and a lot of comparative work um, in those various systems. So welcome, Professor Fraze. So glad that you're here. Um, next, uh, Professor Hugo um, Gonzalez de los is an adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Educational Studies at The Ohio State University. Welcome, Hugo. Uh, he is affiliated uh, with the Learning Technologies Program and was a postdoctoral scholar at the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. He received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from The Ohio State University. He develops human-centered technology to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in educational settings. Welcome. Uh, and Emily Galvin Almanza is a longtime criminal defense attorney and advocate for a more just and humane criminal legal system. She spent six years as a public defender with the Bronx Defenders. Uh, she is, um, I think maybe as many as any of us comfortable on screen, having spent a stint as an anchor on a daily online program offering commentary and critical legal analysis. Um, and she's recently had her five year anniversary as the co-founder and executive director of Partners for Justice, which is a pioneering nonprofit that trains non-attorney advocates to provide clients in the 
criminal legal system with case navigation and wraparound support and helps public defenders protect people from incarceration and from other criminal penalties. Welcome, Emily, thank you so much for joining us. And finally, Kara Hayes, uh, who will moderate today's panel. She joins us on, uh, for, as, uh, 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 not on campus, but at her office at the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, um, where she is the, has been for many years, maybe 20 years or so, plus a victim witness advocate, and more recently, the Director of Restorative Practices and the office's LGBTQIA community liaison. Um, she is also a survivor, circle keeper, and community-based restorative justice practitioner, a fourth-generation Bostonian, um, and a restorative justice specialist who teaches at Suffolk University, um, both um, uh, um, uh, restorative justice, uh, criminal theory, crime and justice um, in the sociology department at Suffolk University. We are so honored to have you join us, Kara, to moderate today's panel, and grateful to all of you for being here. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the five of you to um, lead a conversation and discussion. And we will um, invite the panel, um, sorry, we'll invite participants to share questions through the Q&A. And um, at some point in today's, um, the rest of the afternoon, we'll hope to get to some of those questions. But for now, over to Kara and you all panelists. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, thank you. Just making sure that everyone can hear me in my very analog office that I live in. Thank you for the heads up, Emily. And Emily, I feel like for the rest of us on this panel, given your experience with media, we are all going to be trying to keep up. Um, and um, I wanted to say, Hugo, welcome. Um, and in doing so, recognizing that uh, Simone Drake, your colleague, is not available today, but we will collectively try to lift her voice into this conversation. Um, I feel humbled to help steward this conversation, not, um, and not just because of the work Aminta just did to steward our last beautiful panel and conversation on transitional justice, but also to try to thread the needle to connect that powerful panel to what we'll be doing today um, in the last panel of the afternoon, um, really kind of naming the transitional justice of system design um, and the nature of interrupting the cyclical violence um, that we're going to talk about. So I also wanted to say thank you to the negotiation, mediation and clinical program at Harvard for inviting me to um, help broker this conversation. And in doing so, we'll try to be really intentional. Um, and the structure that we will follow um, is I really want to give our esteemed speakers today a chance to um, give you a sense of their project, um, giving them each maybe five to seven minutes to, to kind of uh, touch on what their work entails and what you've had it, and to remind everybody in the audience that there are links in our chat from Neil and Sarah to take a look more deeply at their research um, to then maybe deepen that um, integrated conversation with some questions from me. Um, and then just to remind you of what Aminta had said, if you joined us for the previous panel, that we really want to weave the questions of the audience, both at the campus and in our online learning community today into this work. Um, and I will be checking the Q&A function, but also um, the chat function for questions to lift up to Hugo, Richard, and Emily, and then really look to sum up our conversation and close. Um, I know Neil mentioned that I'm a circle keeper in doing so, I always think it's really important to say this. I stand on Massachusetts land. I've learned from indigenous people. And as somebody who benefits from white supremacy, nothing that um, has been given to me today has actually come from me. Um, and I think that ties us to the restorative elements of this conversation today. Um, but as a circle keeper, order matters. And I wanted to talk a little bit about order today of how we will navigate the initial part of our conversation. Um, Hugo, we'll start with you, just where your work stands on the on the, like, the threshold and precipice of our system is so important. Richard, we'll turn to you about this transitional justice of really creating this concept of making data come alive and making it tell the stories of deep disparity in the Minnesota courts and what that what that looks like and what that means. 
Um, and finally, batting cleanup for us today will be Emily talking really deeply about how we create structures to support the, the deep need for wraparound services for criminal defense attorneys and their clients. Um, so with that, um, Hugo, I will turn to you. Welcome. Um, and to lift Simone's uh, voice into our conversation, despite her not being able to be with us today, I was struck by something she shared about your project when she said, if a problem persists, it might just be because there's something wrong with the approach to solving that problem. So I was wondering if you could give us some sense of your collaboration um, from your perspective. Absolutely. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for having me in this afternoon. Um, so uh, part of our, we're, we're a group of multidisciplinary uh, researchers uh, at the Ohio State University. Um, we have Katrina Lee from the College of Law. We have Simone Drake from the Department of English and African American and African Studies. Um, Kevin Pasido from the College of Engineering and myself, uh, formerly the College of Engineering and now the College of Education and Human Ecology. Um, so we, 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 we got together with the idea of using technology and research on structural and institutional systems of oppression. Uh, to improve relations between law enforcement here in Columbus and African-American civilians. Uh, so um, we, we, our project was awarded a, a grant from the uh, OSU seed grant in, uh, for racial justice. So we're gonna try to answer the, the research questions that has to do with how can we use technology to enhance instructional training related to diversity and cultural competency while simultaneously reducing resistance or resentment of diversity, equity, and inclusion training in law enforcement settings. And we're partnering with the Columbus Police Department for this, the Columbus Police Academy, uh, in designing uh, a software that will help decrease use of force and assist with de-escalation strategies through scenarios and game design that attend to uh, interpersonal communication and conflict management. Um, so that's a short description of our project. Thank you. And you know, I think this concept of multidisciplinary collaborative projects, um, you know, as somebody who lives with an engineer, um, is I think innovative in really deep ways. Um, and maybe you could talk about like what does that look like. In the you know in this academy of collaboration, of of bringing your discipline and your colleague Simone Drake's um, together, how did you weave that? Well, I think that it's um, traditional. We engineers like to approach a problem using the engineering design method. That's word design there, right? Um, in which uh, we approach the problem, understanding what what's the what are we trying to solve? What are the constraints? And uh, then it's usually an iterative process of proposing a solution, testing it, and refining it. Um, I think that the, the difference with that now is, and this is aligned with the current of human-centered design in engineering. Uh, it, it's about uh, listening to all the voices involved in the issue that we're seeking to alleviate. Um, it's not just about we the engineers or the experts, we come here and this is the solution, take it. No, I mean, there are several um, counter examples to where, where that failed uh, in the humanitarian engineering realm in particular. So, uh, so by, by constructing the system from the different voices of the community members, uh, agents of change, and, and the researchers that are studying these social uh, challenges, uh, we engineers uh, can design help help design the technology, acknowledging all those voices, right? Uh, using uh, mathematics, physics, uh, computer science, 
artificial intelligence nowadays also a very, a very important tool. Um, and it, it's about that. It's about bringing a, a hum, human-centered design more actively in the product design. And in our example, it's a software. In our software, we're trying to uh, listen to the instructors that are important in this uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion training at the Columbus Police Academy. And what their needs are, what are the existing uh, tools, and how this instruction is taking place. Um, and then listening, of course, to Katrina and Simone and, and their colleagues and, and to what, what are the specific goals for th that this software should accomplish, right? Obviously thinking that we're not here to um, replace the human to human interactions in these trainings, but to enhance it. Um, so those are some of the elements that uh, in particular, I myself as an engineer are interested in developing better engineering tools right, for human centered design. You know, and I appreciate that so deeply because we're talking about like the structural components of uh, the, as you think as an engineer in system design, but we're also talking um, much as our previous panelists did um, earlier this afternoon about how do we actually create structure and process in community. So I guess before I turn to Richard as our next panelist, I would ask you this question. You know, thinking about you know so much of, of, of the harm that we're trying to address in today's panel is really recognizing that we do harm through unsafe and abusive systems, structures, institutions, and cultural norms. And I would ask you, perhaps from your system design perspective, um, how did you bring the lived experience of black and brown people into your design and how, you know, as, you know, the child of law enforcement, my father was a police officer, how did you navigate opening the door to such a closed social structure? Uh, since police is not an easy um, relationship to build in these situations. Right, absolutely. And, and of course, and this is a hard question, um, the whole field of engineering and computer science and technology are starting to ask these questions about I mean, uh, uh, where's the bias in our design? Is it in the data we collected or the way we collected the data? Is it in our algorithms or the way we're designing the components? Uh, is it in ourselves as designers? I mean, these are very hard questions that uh, the field is starting to ask. And it, it, along with that comes uh, how do we measure the bias? And how do we overcome it? Right? Um, uh, so we, 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 we are actively reading this literature and trying to incorporate those, right? Uh, and as you well pointed out, I'm trying to bring the realities of the people that are being oppressed. Um, in regard to the um, partnership with the Columbus Police, uh, Columbus Commission Department, I, I have to say that it, they, they, were, they were willing to participate. I mean, I, I, I felt gladly um, uh, surprised at how well this partnership is going and, and how open they are and how they acknowledge that this is an issue, right? And, and we must try different ways of how to, how to try to alleviate, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's my experience with the, with the police department in particular. No, thank you. Um, and we're going to circle back to the themes that you're eliciting, Hugo, but I'm gonna turn to Richard um, with gratitude. You know, I think um, your work tethers us so deeply to our previous panelists' work um, of really thinking, as you said, of like naming this piece of transitional justice. But I wondered if you could speak for our audience today um, to give some breath and scope um, to, the, to the work that you designed with your team. Yeah, there we go. Uh, well, thank you for uh, having us here um, and organizing this whole uh, series of symposia. Um, a little background about the this project that I'm working on and will re be reporting on, like I guess many of the participants in these symposia, uh, it's inspired by the, the tragic uh, murder of George Floyd right here in Minneapolis. 
uh, not the first uh, and not the last uh, uh, unjustified police killing uh, of uh, an African American man. Um, and so the the project I, I should uh, make clear is is not based at my university, University of Minnesota. It's based at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, uh, and particularly their Dispute Resolution Institute. Uh, and one of my co-authors, Sharon Press, uh, is the uh, director of that institute, and decided that uh, they needed to get involved uh, with uh, the. Uh, efforts to to actually move forward after uh, George Floyd's murder. So uh, the, I would say that the the innovative aspect of so it's called the Truth and Action Project. And what's uh, very innovative about it, I think, uh, is that it is both uh, truth and action. Uh, and the truth uh, involves combining uh, statistical data, which I've done a lot of work on. A lot of people have, have seen uh, the, the, the terrible disparity statistics in criminal justice. Uh, but to collect some new, uh, uh, more recent data on that, but to combine it with stories, stories, uh, firsthand accounts uh, from victims of racial uh, dispar disparate treatment and, and abuse, particularly by at the hands of police, uh, to, to bring the data alive. Uh, so, and I think collecting those stories is consistent with the transitional uh, justice model. Uh, but I guess I would um, um, suggest that because this project was is sponsored by a dispute resolution institute, uh, I'm led to, to wonder whether there are a part of the solution uh, to these entrenched problems uh, will benefit from dispute resolution techniques uh, on which I have no expertise, but it seems to me there are people who need to talk to each other uh, within the communities impacted by, by disparities uh, and between those communities and and, and, and public officials. Uh, so the action part of it, again, it's not just uh, uh, tooth telling, it's also uh, trying to develop uh, recommendations uh, for fundamental systemic changes uh, in the criminal justice system. Uh, and as I'll say in a, uh, at some point today, uh, I think you know we are always led back to structural racism in the broader society and all the ways in which we have to be attacking that uh, because that sets the stage for what the criminal justice system uh, deals with. So anyway, just quickly, the, the project, uh, we have a, a large and very diverse advisory board uh, of people who are both uh, uh, representing the criminal justice system, but also uh, impacted communities. Um, uh, we have uh, a, com a community engagement work group uh, that uh, tries to, to learn uh, what the community wants uh, uh, from this project uh, and, and from the system and try to get the community invested in the, in the project and invite people to contribute their stories. So that was an important first step in, in this project. Uh, the story collection work group uh, is uh, uh, in the process of collecting, they hope, about 100 stories. Originally, they thought more. It's slow going. Uh, people are understandably uh, reluctant to come forward and tell their stories uh, to, to someone they don't know. Uh, uh, telling the stories itself a uh, traumatic. Uh, so we built into this, I shouldn't say we, Sharon, she's the, the uh, uh, designer, uh, founder and designer of this project, uh, uh, has built in training on uh, uh, from uh, trauma specialists uh, okay. and uh, kind of provision. Of, out of our system. I'm sorry. Um, sorry, my my technical issues and within my office are, are rather imperfect some days. But, you know, really thinking again that transitional justice is something I think the lay person doesn't necessarily understand, doesn't sit in other countries or in other areas of, the, of our own country, such as Greensboro, but really thinking about that this is a necessary construct in every judicial structure in America and really appreciating Richard, the way of thinking about this as a way of impacting the level of harm that lands on BIPOC communities, but also recognizing like, the multiple forces that are in play. Um, so before I turn to Emily, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, 
and it's really thinking about that piece of racial disproportionality that you have touched on in, in kind of introducing your project to us this afternoon. Um, you know, I'm really kind of curious to ask you, what does that look like as, as people are navigating those stages of the criminal justice process, that process that comes after the piece that Hugo's project is trying to disrupt? Well, racial disproportionality uh, is uh, a, a way of, of measuring disparity by comparing uh, the typically comparing the the proportion of people of a particular racial or ethnic group uh, at a stage, in this case of criminal justice, uh, compared to their percentage in the general population, in this case, the state of Minnesota. Uh, and the counties uh, that we're studying in the Twin Cities. So uh, just to take one example, uh, I mean, uh, not surprisingly, our data uh, work group, the third work group, the one I'm most closely working with, uh, found that once again, there is substantial racial disproportionality, over-representation, particularly of African-Americans and Native Americans uh, at every stage of the criminal justice system, beginning with the first stages we can measure, which is arrest and police, uh, uh, action. Uh, when you get to, just as an example, when you get to the stage of felony conviction uh, in the two major counties we study, the Twin Cities, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey County, about 50% of the people uh, convicted of felonies uh, are African-American, a bit more than that in Hennepin, a bit less than that in Ramsey County, whereas only about 13 to 14% of the residents of those counties are African-American. So that is a huge racial disproportionality. Thank you. Um, we'll, we're, we're going to pick up the thread of that conversation again, Richard, but I wanted to, to turn to Emily and to ask her to walk us through what your process looks like as you are celebrating the fifth anniversary of the, the birthing of your project. <laughs> I'm so happy you put it that way because I was pregnant with my daughter when I started my project and I always joke with people that I had twins. Um, one of them happens to be a nonprofit, uh, <laughs> but, but she's a good sister. Um, so I, I actually think that where Richard left off is a great place to pick up because um, so much of my project is about recognizing that, as you said, if we have a problem and we are, it is an intractable ongoing problem, perhaps we are going about solving that problem the wrong way. Well, I would call our criminal legal system an intractable, ongoing, devastating, racially biased human rights problem. Um, some people think of it as like an other people problem, talking a little bit to privileged white people here. Um, it's not an other people problem. A full 40% of Americans have a loved one who's been incarcerated. 80 million people in this country have a criminal record. And in fact, the way this infiltrates people's lives goes so far beyond the sort of like Dick Wolf TV show version we have of criminal law. Um, a person who's been incarcerated, if they are not white, sees their lifetime earnings cut in half. A year of incarceration adds 10 to 15 years to someone's physiognomy and cuts two years off their life expectancy. Um, we actually just saw a study that I read maybe two days ago about the impact of mere contact with police, even absent arrest, when a, a young person, when a, someone under 18, has any contact with police, it causes immediately anxiety, depression, and literally immediate disengagement from school. They did a study showing kids were disengaged from school like the next day because of any contact with police. So the scale of the harm of the system is staggering. Um, the system does a very good job of rendering a lot of it invisible by dehumanizing the people who it primarily impacts or primarily, as Richard pointed out, black and brown, people, um, often low-income people in this country. So essentially, my project is looking at the system as a whole and thinking, where can we best intervene to make a difference today? I am waiting for Hugo to fix policing. I am waiting for other people to fix policy and sentencing and all of this stuff. And I'm like, okay, y'all go do policy. That is great somebody needs to make sure that fewer people are being harmed like today. And I, I'm trying to take that on. So looking at the system, we've got a system where the intake valve is really, really broken. Um, policing is disproportionately lodged towards people of color, located in communities of color. Um, 
sort of filtered through this lens of bias. And then the supposed control valve of judges and prosecution who are supposed to serve as a check on who police bring to them um, are also dealing with the, the combined forces of the bias of seeing black and brown people presented to them by police again and again, um, a long history of um, biased prosecution, biased plea bargaining in this country. As we know, 95% of cases end in plea bargains, very few go to trial, and also just the rife dehumanization that the system imposes upon system actors. If you are operating in a system and it is your job every day to put on a robe and go put people into prisons and jails, that is an emotionally really difficult job to do. And the system tries to make it easier by referring to people as felons or addicts or defendants or offenders um, rather than a 27 year old mother of two. Um, so there's these sort of combined forces that are, are all pushing towards continuation of and amplification of the existing structural bias of our system. My paper talks a lot about the history of this, about how it was built this way, it is not an accident. Um, but just to focus on my own work in it here, I am a former public defender, uh, as was noted at the top, I actually practiced in California and then went out to the Bronx Defenders. And to me, public defenders are the single most underappreciated, underutilized, high potential leverage point in the system. So think about it. Public defenders are really, really upstream. In most places, they are assigned immediately to people who are accused. 80% um, of people roughly in the criminal legal system are represented by public defenders. So they have access to a huge swath of the people being impacted by the system. They have confidential, loyal access, meaning that if I am your defender, you can tell me what is really going on in your life, the full complexity of it, good or bad, and I can't tell anybody, and I can't do anything that's gonna hurt you. All I can do is act in your best interest and help. So it's a very safe, protected relationship that defenders have. And it's also not an opt-in service. You don't have to like, in an ideal world, some places have annoying paperwork, but public defenders are generally automatically assigned. So you're not being asked to visit different service providers and sign up for a defender or find a lawyer. Ideally, you're not being asked to pay for it. Looking at the state of Iowa and some of their pay to play practices. Um, the thing is, when you give public defenders the resources to engage an interdisciplinary toolkit, you're giving them better skills to deal with the underlying drivers of system involvement than any other system actor has. A police officer's primary tool is a jail cell. A prosecutor's primary tool is a jail cell. But a public defender's primary tool can be a respectful, client-led, dignified, opt-in <laughs> process that lets people have the support they need with the things that are going on with them that can let them move away from the criminal legal system with their life and future intact. Um, my program is called Partners for Justice. We help public defenders build out these interdisciplinary collaborative services. We call it collaborative defense, what we're doing. And basically what we do is we help defenders create non-attorney teams in their offices that can help people with housing support, job readiness, um, employment services, um, <laughs> benefits access, other sort of income related access, um, educational advocacy, fighting against, excuse me, against suspensions and expulsions, um, family unity, vital document gathering, like basically the, the team's job is to meet people where they are, find out what's going on, bring in other players as needed, a housing lawyer, an employment lawyer, a treatment provider, substance use treatment, you know, whoever is needed, make a team and make it really easy for the client to feel like they have one person they can turn to to navigate that entire team so that they're not being asked to interface with 16 different agencies between nine and five on weekdays while working two jobs and having a kid under five. <laughs> like, the goal is to make it really, really, really easy. We advance this collaborative defense framework as a racial equity proposition because at the end of the day, this is what rich white people get normally in the system. I ask people often to think of the Brock Turner case and I raise it because it's really inflammatory and people remember it and it is it, it gets people right, punches you right in the stomach. In that case, a judge looked at a, you know, a higher income white man with the privilege of education and position at Stanford and saw his potential, saw his potential more than what he was accused of. Um, as someone who has represented people charged with things that are so minor, it would turn your hair blue just to know that they got arrested for it. I'm talking about stealing a piece of pizza or a pair of socks I'm talking about um, you know, selling water in front of Yankee Stadium. I'm talking about things that are like 
really, really not the scale of the Brock Turner case. And judges looked at my clients and saw them as disposable, saw them as people who needed to be punished, punished for selling water in front of Yankee Stadium, punished for selling a bag of mangoes. Um, we want to make the system see our 80% of people who are public defender clients with the same lens of potential and value that the system naturally affords to people of wealth and privilege. So the goal of collaborative defense is to essentially get that thousand dollar an hour legal defense that promotes potential and future achievement and democratize it, break it open and, and make it available to everyone. You know, you're known for actually helping people to recognize something that seems impossible for them to manage on their own, which is public defenders are public safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank Can you. you. More about that. Um, uh, my reaction <laughs> was a little too delighted at that question. <laughs> yes, yes. I feel like so often people think of public defenders as this sort of like unpleasant constitutionally mandated thing. Like, oh God, we have to give money to the like shabby defense lawyers with their holes in their shoes. Um, in fact, when we think about recidivism, okay, look, look at this way. You get this whole system, millions of people confined in it or under its supervision. And across the board nationwide, you've got recidivism rates. In other words, rates of people being released and then by whatever measure, engaging in some new harm or getting rearrested, those are not the same thing, um, and coming back into that system at a rate of around 60%. When we look at the things that stop that from happening, that make it much more likely someone will succeed, there are three major factors, housing, income, and access to care. If a person's got a place to live, a way to feed themselves, and mental health or substance use treatment support, you know, whatever kind of care they need in order to feel stable and supported, they are dramatically less likely to engage in harm. When you look at what good public defenders are literally already doing, it's housing, it's income, it's access to care. These expansions are a form of addressing the needs that people have that create safety. So my hope is that when you empower a public defender who is there with someone in that moment of crisis to address the drivers of that crisis and the fallout from that crisis, you are doing something that is inherently pro-safety. If you want a world where we can replace the police with something else or not need the police, you need to invest in the forms of safety that make people more likely to succeed. And those things are supportive services delivered easily accessibly at the moment of crisis. For this reason, I'm constantly pointing out that it's not just that public defenders are super pro-safety, much more pro-safety than mandated services because public defenders can do things in a client-led way that is more likely to succeed. We, we all know that you can't force someone to change. Like if the person is ready to do something and you can provide the thing they're ready to do, it works way better than threatening someone to comply. Um, so if we can build out the public defender's capacity to offer those opportunities, it's not just increasing safety, it's economic mobility, it's protecting those lifetime earnings that I was talking about. It's health, it's diminishing healthcare costs by connecting people to the care they need um, in order to take care of themselves and their families. It's family unity, it's more parents at home with their kids and more kids being able to stay in school and importantly their home school, not some, often kids are kicked out of their normal school when they get in trouble with the system and fighting to get them back into normal school, it's a whole thing. So it's this, it's this way, the system's fallout is complex. Public defenders are really well situated to address its full complexity. And that is deeply pro-safety, pro-equity, and pro-opportunity. Oh, thank you. And you know, in thinking about this concept, and I think it came up with Richard and also Hugo about how intractable these, these monoliths that you're trying to disrupt individually and collectively are, is really just remembering that intractable, though they may seem, uh, that we're really seeing these society-wide issues that you're 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 trying to tackle are really just like innumerable individual decisions that, that people make along the way and that brings me to circle back to Richard right and when you were talking Richard about how do we make data come alive and Emily was was bringing that data to life I think just now in her remarks and these data points these individual decisions that end up in these negative and racially disparate outcomes that we're trying to interrupt I guess I would ask you you know Emily is trying to give the tools 
to defense attorneys, to navigate holistically, Hugo is trying to interrupt the, the funneling of, of people into the system. I guess I would ask you, Richard, like what can be done in, in your thinking as an expert on sentencing disparity, as somebody taking this collaborative process to reduce these disparities at these stages within the system? Well, I guess um, you start and a major purpose of the data collection part of this, uh, but hopefully illustrated by the, the stories, uh, is to uh, drill down and zero in on the particular uh, stages of the criminal justice process where uh, disparity is, is strongest or gets worse. Uh, and, and what we're finding, and it's consistent with, with prior research, that um, there's there's not much change in measures of racial disproportionality, uh, as I defined it earlier, uh, between the, the beginning of the criminal justice process and the stage of conviction. Uh, in some jurisdictions, it grows at each stage, not so much in Minnesota, but the, we have a big jump at the stage uh, of sentencing when the sentencing guidelines kick in. Uh, and that's because the guidelines give a very strong uh, weight to the offender's prior conviction record, uh, sometimes from 15 years ago. Uh, and that's uh, the subject of one of the projects that was described in my, in my bio. Um, so we need to cut those back because not only do they have a major disparate impact on, on uh, people of color, especially African-Americans and Native American offenders, but uh, there's a very limited uh, justification in terms of either giving people their just desserts or uh, public safety in those enormous uh, criminal history enhancements. So that's one thing we can and should do. Uh, but the other thing that we notice in this data, once again, is that most of the disproportionality is already present uh, at the beginning of the process, uh, uh, and particularly in arrest statistics, uh, which are about as dis disproportionate as the conviction uh, statistics that I quoted earlier. And we, what we don't know, and what is very difficult to, to know in any precise way, how much of that is a police bias, individual, uh, explicit, implicit bias, uh, policy decisions about where and how to enforce the criminal law. Uh, and we can do things about that through better training, uh, more transparency, uh, more accountability for those decisions. Um, but a certain amount of that uh, front door disparity uh, reflects crime rates in the community, uh, which in, in turn uh, are the tragic legacy of slavery and, and Jim Crow uh, and uh, the ethnic cleansing of Native Americans uh, and all of that history. So it, it leads us back into the broader society, the structural racism uh, and disadvantage of that society. That's not something the criminal justice system can, can improve, but we could at least try to not make it worse. And one of the things we do in criminal justice is we take up a, a lot of disadvantaged people and we make them even more disadvantaged and therefore more vulnerable uh, to being involved once again in the criminal justice system. So, you know, the communities, I, I was impressed by, many of you may have read James Foreman's book uh, about locking up our own, uh, where he talks about how uh, the Black leadership in the District of Columbia uh, seemed to be in, in favor of more aggressive criminal law enforcement. Well, that wasn't all they asked for. They also asked for improved programs, health, uh, welfare, education, employment, but all they got was increased uh, criminal law enforcement. Uh, and we need to uh, do both of those things. And we also need to ask the people in those communities, uh, and that is something that stories can begin to, to tell us, but that could also be organized in some, in some more systematic way uh, uh, to help us, to, to tell us what they want the system to do about issues of crime and disorder in their uh, neighborhoods. And I think I'm, I'm, Emily was talking about how uh, you address the underlying problems, it's actually a crime control uh, measure, and that's what those communities need and want, I think. Can I just add one little thing to, to something? And then we'll I, turn to you, Hugo. I will be brief, I swear. Um, I also just wanted to point out, you know, a lot of jurisdictions I've worked in are like 80% misdemeanor jurisdictions, where the bulk of the people who are in the system are there for things that, if we are being honest, 
wealthy white suburban kids are doing all the time and simply not getting arrested for. So I think it, I just wanted to parse for a second the, the question of where crime is happening, because I just wanted to place that note that there's a ton of things that are perceived as crime in black communities that are not treated as crime in communities of privilege. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's the reality doesn't always fit our narrative schemas, right? And I think that's where Hugo, your data is so, and the constructs of engineering are so important to bring to the, to the policy piece. Um, but we are a hyper-policed space in the United States. But I think, Emily, you're making a really good point. It depends on what you look like. And as somebody from a biracial family, my experience, as you're touching on, Emily, has not been the experience of the men of color who share my large forehead, but don't share my experience with law enforcement. Um, and Hugo, that really, that turns me again to you, right? You know, we're still in this structure where, you know, black folks in our country are 28% of the people killed by police. When they're only 13% of the population, we've already had 290 people murdered this year. And we're only in the beginning of April. So what are you help, I guess, to actually deepen our conversation about your pressure, your process and your structural thinking about creating systems? It's like it's not lost on me that we have been convened at Harvard where the implicit bias test is something that many of us who stand outside of academia are aware of. What are you trying to capture in that, in that software engagement to help prevent this funnel of black and brown people into the system that Richard is capturing in his collective work and that Emily is trying to sustain defense counsel through. Right. Um, you know, I think our project, it's, uh, it's the first step, it's our first effort as a, as a group. Um, therefore, we try to narrow it towards a, a project that is um, feasible uh, to and, and that was the supporting the, the efforts of uh, instructors on diversity, equity, inclusion at, at, at the Columbus Police Academy uh, to facilitate and enhance the work they're doing. Um, so the, 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 I think the theoretical component in our technology, in our software, right? The, 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 the main tenet there is the presenting future police, members of the police force with scenarios in which they can be aware of their decision-making and reflect on that with the help of the instructors. Uh, and pr as a product of that reflection, I will hope that uh, the, the decision-making is made less biased towards African Americans, uh, which is what uh, it's been seen nowadays across the country. Um, so what the, what the technology can offer is in, instead of a one size fit all offer, really a, a personalized interaction with the software, in which um, the scenarios or features of the scenario, we could be virtual reality. That's easier. I was going to say this sounds like virtual yeah. reality, the matrix. Right. It's um, the features in that scenario are modulated, right, to meet where the user is at that particular point, right, and to try to navigate towards less biased decision making, um, towards African American in particular, as I said. Um, so that 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 feedback loop, right, of testing the decision-making, learning about it, reflecting, and then doing it again, it's what drives this, this program, this intervention. And, and hopefully that will be translated later on in less, in better relationship with the African-American community here in Columbus. Thank you. So I wanted to offer a gentle prod 
to our online learning community today and also to those students and attendees that are actually physically in the space with Neil and Sarah that I am going to be watching our Q&A format and I am watching um, our chat well enough that I just see that a question has come up. So um, I'm going, I'm going to offer a question um, to all three of you and we'll work it through the same order. Hugo, we'll start with you. We'll turn to Richard and then to Emily. So our question is this, for your projects, the approaches, the stories that come out of your work seems so compelling in your telling. Um, what are the barriers to getting greater traction for these messages? So Hugo, I'll start with you. We'll turn to Richard and then to Emily. Um, so yeah, one, one major finding that we have as, it was, as we were serving literature is that there is um, resentment and resistance to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training in, in law enforcement settings. Um, so the, the hope we have is that by building this software that is transparent enough in which uh, during the feedback process, right, that's being uh, delivered by both instructor and the software, right, the, the police members can reflect and understand and it's in a language that they can understand. Right? So that's what interpretability means in, their, in the field of intelligence systems. So if we can build a system that's interpretable by them, uh, we hope to have to, to reduce that resentment or the resistance toward this training. Um, and a, a follow-up question to your response before I turn to Richard. I don't, I don't, you know, as someone who has lived and breathed law enforcement culture for over 30 years, what you're saying to me is not a surprise. But as somebody who also creates system and design systems, I'm, I would I would wonder if you could speak to our audience a little bit more about what what is pushing that resistance. Um, what are you seeing as somebody designing this 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 learning system for them? What's pushing that? I don't think any of us will be necessarily surprised, but I, I would like to elicit that deeper piece of question from you. Well, I have to apologize that my experience is not as fast as my colleague Simone Drink, who couldn't make it here today. But um, and from from my short experiences in interacting with with the stakeholders and. I think uh, the, there is a cultural element in law enforcement, right? That's, as you said, I mean, it's, these are norms that are present uh, and that comes from uh, cohort to cohort and sometimes from generation to generation that are indeed creating this, uh, or, or, or that are perpetuating biases. Uh, in this particular community, right? So um, that, that's one of the elements that I, I could uh, see and, and experience. And also during our you know, literature review, that's one of the main elements, right? So that's what I could speak of, uh, uh, a particular example there. But I'm sure that there are others that I'm just uh, touching the surface in this. Yes, and what has been the responsiveness when the police are navigating your system design? What has that been like in, in, in the retelling of that experience? Does it breaking some of these biases? So the, we are at the stage still of prototyping. So it's ha we haven't implemented the, the, the project yet, right? We are at the stage of um, prototyping the back end, which is the part that um, drives the, um, the behavior of the program or, or of the scenario or the game. Um, and we're doing that in a participatory way with the Columbus, the Academy and our uh, colleagues. Um, so we're still, I could not provide a definite answer to that yet because we still are in, in that stage yet. Um, Richard, in, in turning to you, it occurs to me that you have been sharing this message for 
your academic career and thinking about sentencing disparities um, in very deep ways. And then you did touch on, as you were speaking with us, um, the difficulty sometimes in capturing those stories, those messages of impacted people in the system, because the structural realities of trust are incredibly complex. Um, but rather than answering that question for you, I'd like to pose the same question to you. This is so powerful. It's such necessary work, and it has been long before the murder of George Floyd. What are you seeing as the barriers to getting better traction for the data that you know to be true? Well, uh, I guess in, in terms of the data that we've had for a long time and that people like me have been uh, digging out and, and pointing out, um, you know, how many people read those, uh, those studies? Uh, I mean, there are task forces that do it sometimes and get a little more publicity. Now, the, the new element, as I said earlier, of collecting these stories, the lived experiences, the human face uh, on, on uh, disparate uh, treatment and mistreatment, that, that's, a, at least in Minnesota, a new thing, uh, at least in this way of gathering it and presenting it. Uh, so I'm hopeful that it will uh, produce a better response. I mean, one of the problems is in the past, the stories tended to be told by people who were currently or recently facing uh, some sort of charges. So I'm, I think their complaints were discounted. Uh, here, people are, are voluntarily coming forward uh, without anything particular to benefit uh, from it. And, and I'm looking forward to reading those stories. So we, we're now finally collecting them at a faster rate, uh, but uh, with that, that hasn't been conveyed to, to, to me yet. But I'm, I'm hopeful that, that we might uh, uh, get a little more reaction there. I think it would also be a way to, to uh, turn back to the police and say, look, most of these complaints seem to be about police behavior and you're getting complaints to to into your uh, about your officers all the time uh, but you're uh, you don't seem to be doing uh, enough with them including some of the officers charged with with homicide in recent years uh, those stories are already there uh, and now you're charged to take them more seriously uh, than you have in the past thank you you know Emily I I know that um one of my favorite quotes from you is that it is your anger that drives your empathy. And in thinking about this question, that is a push for me, right? Like these, these are the these are the truths and realities of the system I've worked in my whole life. Yet people don't hear the narrative, even when it's powerful first person account, or from Richard and Hugo's perspective, statistically um, sound. So. I guess I would speak to that anger that drives empathy, but also like, what do you see? What, why are we having the barriers to these stories landing for people so that we can change system? Well, I think one of the big problems is that it's not a system, right? <laughs> like the, the constitution reserves criminal law to the states and the states pass it off to the counties and sometimes the municipalities. So sometimes you have within a state, a state system, a county system and a municipal system divided over 3,142 counties and the District of Columbia. So it's sort of like, you can be all out here knowing how to do things better, which I think we do. Um, and then you've got 3,142 local governments that you need to like, convince. And then guess what? Like doing the thing is actually hard. Um, it's one thing to say like, hey, it's a really good idea to provide wraparound services inside the public defender. Yes, it is totally a good idea. Part of the reason my organization exists is because defenders say, yes, that's a great idea. No idea how to do that. Housing stabilization, not my field. I'm a criminal defense lawyer. Like, I don't know how to do a benefits application. So building the expertise, building the local partnerships, getting people collaborating in a way that is intentional and not ad hoc. Um, it takes a lot of work. Um, the thing is, the work has a really, really, really big payoff. But I think that in this system, and by the way, that really fuels the anger, right? Like I, I know a very sensible way to make everybody safer and more prosperous and healthy. I know how to do this. Will you please just let me do it? I'm ready to do it. <laughs> please call me. Um, and, you know, fighting the fight of like, it's not just that we know how to do it better and we have the means to do it better. It's that not doing it better is 
destroying people's lives in ways that are almost too painful to think about, engage in, let alone experience. And I think that's another huge problem too, right? Is we are living in a world where we are dealing with ongoing climate catastrophe, a pandemic, uh, violence, Ukraine, um, you know, <laughs> the loss of the child tax care credit, like uh, inflation, um, poverty. People have so many simultaneous crises pulling on their attention. But oftentimes when we're talking about criminal law, the response we get is, yeah, 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 but those people can wait. And that's why I started by saying it's not an other people problem. It's an all of us problem. It's a half of Americans almost having an incarcerated loved one family problem. Um, it's a problem that when you walk down the street in any on any given day, if you want the people around you to be happy and healthy and not, you know, desperate or suffering, like to me, that's that's a that's a me problem too. I am a privileged white woman. I am at very low risk of being arrested in this country or being harmed by our criminal legal system. But I want to live in a world where my neighbors aren't at risk of being harmed either. I want to live in a world where when I walk down the street, I know that if someone is suffering, it is feasible for them to get help rather than to simply be thrown away. So that juxtaposition of the scale of the problem and the detachment of many people from caring about that problem or the feasibility of the solution and the lack of you know, willingness on the part of people who are steeped in a very carceral tradition to engage in that solution. I'll tell you one of the most maddening things in the world is, um, People, you know, the, the continued insistence of big voices in the media supporting the idea that jail makes anybody better, right? You can't get well in a cell. Like, <laughs> there's nobody out there who's like, you know what? Everything was going terribly, but then I went to jail. <laughs> it fixed everything. Some people have amazing fortitude and in spite of going, in spite of experiencing incarceration, managed to find beautiful outcomes. I credit those individuals entirely. I do not credit the system with producing that. I credit the individual who was able to survive well. But I guess what I, what I mean to say is the biggest barrier is detachment emotionally, inability to engage with the scale of harm and the complexity of a non-system system. That being said, I love notes of hope. I think we could all use a little bit more hope these days, right? Um, I've seen a tremendous change in the last year in the way local governments are engaging with this work. I've spent the last year talking to county councils and county boards of supervisors and some state legislators and hearing people say, hey, you know what? You're right, this makes sense. Uh, if I want to augment my public defender and build that out, like where do I start? Yes, let's do it. I appeared in front of a county council late, uh, late last year, maybe it was January, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. They don't wanna use their jail anymore if they don't have to. They would like to just stop utilizing it if, if at all possible, which by the way is really sensible. Jails are expensive and criminogenic. So it's like very, very sensible for the government to say, can we not do this thing anymore? But just to hear a county council say, you know what, yes, let's try something new. Let's try something better. The problem hasn't been solved in the ways we've been trying to solve it. Let's try something different gives me enormous hope that that is the beginning of a trend, even in a time of great polarization and great fear. I think it's something we can all like safety, opportunity, economic mobility are things we can all agree on regardless of where we stand politically. Um, if we can just get past the racism of it all. Um, so I think that we are in a moment of opportunity and I'm, I'm hoping that we don't blow it. Oh, that makes my heart hurt. Um, and it's it's so accurate, right? And um, I always think of hope as a muscle and that we're at this moment in, um, in time when it is for all the reasons you've elicited um, so, so hard to hope. And, um, but hope was the question I wanted to ask next because I feel like, although we're talking about programmatic structure, academic analysis, statistical resonance, we're also speaking about hope. Um, and, um, you know, for me, that's where we get into the heart zone. And one of my favorite restorative teachers is always talking about it's our heart zone that allows us to work on harm and conflict. And all of what you're talking about today as a panel is about harm and conflict. So I wanted, I wanted to turn to you, Hugo, and ask, ask a question that is about hope, but I think is also programmatic and kind of structural. What is you 
what are you hoping for? What are you and Simone hoping for as, a, as an outcome of your collaboration with the, uh, with the police department in question for your DEI work? Right. Um, well, yeah, I've, I, I, I've, I've entered the, the realm of multidisciplinary work with, uh, after experiencing, as Emily said, uh, hope uh, while seeing my, my wife is into, my, my wife is a preschool teacher. So I, uh, uh, in, in a very underserved neighborhood in Columbus, Ohio. So I I get to experience her work and her impact every day I and mean, the impact that she has on kids. And uh, after I entered into, uh, I did my postdoc with uh, the Crane Center of Early Childhood Research and Policy, where I get to see these true agents of change, um, teachers, social workers, psychologists, right? And as Emily now is pointing out, public defenders, right? Making tremendous, tremendous uh, changes and improvements into the lives of, of people uh, that I think that what we hope, I mean, I, I bring it to our project now, what we hope is that technology can uh, facilitate and amplify the work of these agents of change in this, in this particular case, and the, an instructor of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? so that um, members of the police force could um, enter into a, a negotiation or into a relationship with their community, with the people they're serving, that's less violent and it leads to less incarceration, less people getting into the system as you guys pointed out. So that's our hope, that's what motivates us. Um, yeah, I think that, I hope I answer your question. Yes, no, and I think too, um, is also just more people alive, right? More mm -hmm. people alive. Um, you know, Richard, I'm gonna ask you the same question. I, I think as you, you've mentioned, one of the things that you mentioned is bringing data to life. So it's not static on the page, but it's really reflective of the human cost of the system. But what is your hoped for outcome in this process that you have embarked on? <laughs> I, I wish I could be more optimistic, but I, 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 will, uh, I will try. I guess, um, as I said before, I, th I think uh, the human face helps, uh, especially by, by uh, another thing I didn't mention is just uh, it, it's, it brings to life the the innumerable daily low level discretionary decisions that that police officers make which we we take for granted yes police uh, you know have to uh, make on the spot decisions uh, and enforce the law well you know some of those uh, decisions um probably shouldn't be left to the lower level uh, officers. Uh, I think in George Floyd's case, there's no reason why somebody like that should be taken into custody uh, for such a minor crime. That's a higher level decision. And, it, and, and, and so when we bring these stories to life and we build on, on terrible uh, stories like uh, George Floyd's murder, uh, it, it puts some, uh, I, I think, appropriate pressure uh, on the, uh, the police leadership uh, to supervise their uh, train and supervise their uh, officers more, uh, take away some of the discretion that they don't need to have, uh, rethink some of the uh, law enforcement uh, policies, as Emily was saying, uh, and as a project that was cooked up in Minnesota called We Are All Criminals uh, has documented thoroughly, uh, most people, myself included, uh, have committed crimes but we were lucky enough to, to not be detected or not at least not formally processed. Uh, and uh, so when, when, and again, police have to work with impacted communities about what kinds of crime and disorder do they want handled? How do they want it handled? Another thing I'm optimistic about is that, you know, it's, you know the good side of the defund movement, which unfortunately got labeled uh, and, and caricatured, but uh, it is appropriately turning attention to the things that we don't need armed police officers to do uh, and the resources that we need to have on the street 
uh, as well as uh, uh, backing up. So uh, I, I think there is there is movement there, uh, and maybe the stories can can further bring it to light. Thank you, Richard. Emily, I feel so hopeful as somebody who's in the trenches of my system all the time and realize how hard my colleagues in the defense bar are working to hold that fabric that you're trying to weave together. What, what makes you hopeful? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because <laughs> I think people are starting to realize we had this great movement about progressive or decarceral prosecution recently. And of course the defund movement, however people want to Whatever language makes you happy, the idea that perhaps police are being used for too many things and that when we use them for too many things, really, really, really bad lethal results happen. Um, and the, the point I often make to people is, you know, if you really like decarceral prosecution, even the best decarceral prosecutor in the world can't offer somebody a great solution unless they go to that person's defense lawyer and ask them what this person would like to do, needs, would benefit from. <laughs> So it's sort of like you're investing in the side of the system that is not best positioned to do the thing you want them to do. It gives me hope that we are being heard when we say so these days. It gives me hope that people want, that people want to engage that, right? 10 years ago, nobody wanted to hear anything about restorative solutions. They wanted to increase sentence lengths and put people in prison for as many years as they possibly could. And if I said, we need to build a world in which race and wealth no longer determine legal outcomes. 10 years ago, people would have denied that race and wealth determine legal outcomes. At least today, I'm getting agreement. I'm getting people saying, you know what, you're right. Yes, we do need to build a world in which race and wealth. How? How? What is the best way to decouple race and wealth from our legal system? And here we are in this room talking about all of these different ideas and initiatives. And we're just like, this is the tip of the tip of the tip. This is, like, this is like three ice crystals on the glacier of all of the different ways in which people are working towards reform. And there are so many great organizations that are arising from community grassroots organizations led by system impacted people. And all of the funders I talked to right now are interested in investing in the people who have actually experienced this harm to come up with solutions, not just the usual like nonprofit industrial complex thing, which is phenomenal. I mean. Again, this is a revolution that has played out over the last five years. And I think that because we've experienced a fire hose to the face in terms of world history, we often forget how notable this moment is. I would say that I think it's incumbent upon all of us who work in this field to try to hold the line when it comes to evidence-based solutions. And here's what I mean. There's a lot of hysteria in the media about like what reform does. Bail reform caused a crime wave. No, it did not. If we look at the data, there's actually more crime in cities where they didn't do bail reform because jails are criminogenic. So I think that sometimes we win the data battle and we lose the comms battle because we're really, really good at analyzing the problem and coming up with thoughtful solutions. And sometimes pro-carceral interests are just much better at telling a scary story. I always think about how much fear motivates people right? How much we, people are attracted to fear. People like scary movies. They like scary books. If you're telling a story about like crime is rising and the bad guys are out there and we got to stop these bad, you're turning reality into a Marvel movie and people buy it. And so we who do not want reality to be a Marvel movie, but rather want to invest in things that actually work and heal and transform and build. I think we need to be really, really loud because otherwise the moment we're in could slip away in this sort of wave of fear and inaccurate narratives. Um, that being said, the last, I, I wanna end on a hopeful note, not a slipping away on a river of fear note. I, <laughs> but um, I think one thing that, that's beautiful is the safety conversation can be a place to win over people who disagree with you in a really beautiful way. Um, I'll never forget that when I was working on the three strikes reform in California, one of the people who agreed with us the most readily was Grover Norquist. Why? You might think that Grover Norquist thought that prisons were expensive. They are. More expensive for elderly people. They are. And that incarcerating elderly people for low level things is really dumb. It is. But in fact, if I recall correctly, what motivated him the most was the simple unfairness of the three strikes law. It's just really unfair to put someone in prison for stealing a pair of socks. And 
finding that common ground with people who disagree with us is such a rarity these days. Yeah, uh, it's also, yeah sorry. <laughs> I was just going to end and say it's, it's also a way to get people talking about race in a moment when people are really scared of the race conversation and flipping out about it and flipping out about critical race theory in our schools. I think that we can get people talking about race in this zone more easily than in other zones. And I think it's like a can opener to some really good conversations. So that also gives me hope. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to turn back to Neil and Sarah on that powerful note. Um, but I wanted to, to see like, you know, as we close out our process in a good way, um, Hugo and Richard, did you have any final, final thoughts, a word or two to close us out about our space today? Hugo, do you? I just wanted to thank again for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Um, uh, and I, I, I hope we can meet again uh, in the future once we have uh, our project with the better results or the results already in place and, and we can provide a note of hope with data and with a program that works in reducing violence. Thank you. Agreed. And thank you for opening the door to this process. Richard. Well, again, uh, thanks for inviting uh, us all here. Uh, and I just want to echo uh, or at least support uh, what Emily said. Uh, and I'm a little more optimistic based on the stories that she's uh, telling us. So uh, let us go forward. <laughs> Thank you on, on every level for interrupting the systems that hold people in chains. And with that, I will turn to Sarah and Neil to close out our process today. Thank you so much, all of you, um, and um, it was incredibly enriching to hear the work you're doing, the stories that you're learning, the stories that you have to share. Um, I appreciate the messages of hope, but also the messages of how hard it is and the anger that is there that can drive empathy and needs to drive maybe action and the, the work that each of you is doing to, um, like Kara just said, interrupt um, systems that need interrupting and changing and redesigning and rethinking. Um, and that's what this symposium has been all about. It's, uh, we are so grateful to each of you for um, the work that you're doing, uh, both in the scholarship and in the um, the day-to-day the -day action, taking action, making sure that um, real stories about real people in real ways um, is being applied in um, truly important and, some, and in many ways groundbreaking ways to interrupt the systems and the cycles that have um, caused a lot of injustice and and need to change as you've all highlighted today. So thank you to every single one of you and and that goes equally for the panel that joined us earlier this afternoon. We're both really blessed and and thankful to have um, had an opportunity to be part of this and and grateful to all of you and Kara for moderating this panel. Um, our huge and and undying thanks um, for skillfully um, um, leading that conversation. Thank you incredibly grateful um, and humbled to be um, in the presence of these three thought leaders. Thank you. Thank you all. And Sarah? <laughs> yeah, I think blessed and humbled are words that are on my mind um, as we close the event today. Um, so just to offer the briefest closing, um, again, uh, thank you. And I think we want to especially bring our gratitude uh, in this moment back to um, our colleagues at OSU and Stanford who have uh, been uh, working alongside of us, and we're just so honestly uh, humbled to be a, a small part of this, this effort. I want to particularly mention Carl Smallwood, Jan Martinez, Carrie McClellan, Justin Bryant, and in particular to Bill Froelich. Um, and I say in particular because, uh, Bill, your energy, your persistence, your passion for this topic has helped us all as a group, uh, group um, craft this effort and, and as uh, come to this moment today, which um, is a uh, bittersweet one <laughs> for us as we close this, this series. Yeah, and if that group of uh, colleagues will, um, will, will have us, we'd like to continue with you in the spirit of cooperation on the project that we started here and, and implemented over these three symposium events and have talked about already wanting to, among the group of us, continue and find ways to advance this and um, get to the next um, challenge the next symposium, the next way of gathering ideas and action in one place to hear about what's what's working and what needs to be done and what needs to change and how we need to rethink design um, for racial justice and equity. Um, so we're excited about that um, and what could come next and hope that um, everything that's happened today and over the past two um, events has inspired others to um, to come around again for the next one and inspired all of us to, to stick in it and stick with it so that we can um, keep this work moving forward. 
So thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, and we wish you all a wonderful weekend. Lovely weekend, everybody. Thanks for being with us today.